Wednesday, July 8th, 2020, morning session of the Port Portland City Council. Carla, good morning. Can you please call the roll? Good morning, Mayor. Hardesty? Here. You Daly? Here. Fritz? Here. Wheeler? Here. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of the Council are attending remotely by video and teleconference, and the City has made several avenues available for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The meeting is available to the public on the City's YouTube channel, eGovPDX, www.portlandoregon.gov slash video, and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony to the Council by emailing the council clerk at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. The council is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and to promote physical distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, your flexibility, and your continued understanding as we manage through this challenging situation to do the city's business. Uh, we do not have communications nor today, uh, so we will go with the time certain item first. That is time certain item number 521, Carla. Second reading. Where are we gonna have the city attorney read the rules? Oh yeah, I forgot. That's like the, the best part of the whole meeting. Go ahead, <laughs> uh, who do we have here today from the city it, attorney's office? It's Lori. Hey Lori. Good morning. Good morning. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions for the first readings of ordinances. The published council agenda at portlandoregon.gov backslash auditor contains information about how and when you may sign up for testimony while the city council is holding electronic meetings. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify. <clears throat> The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When your time is up, the presiding officer will ask you to conclude. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being placed on hold or ejected from the remainder of the electronic meeting. Please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. All right, good. Thank you very much for that, Lori. We appreciate it. First item, Carla's 521, time certain second reading. Readopt remanded ordinance for the Central City 2035 plan and amend the comprehensive plan, comprehensive plan map, transportation system plan, Willamette Greenway plan, scenic resources protection plan, and zoning map, authorize adoption of administrative rules, and repeal and replace their central city plans and documents. Very good. Thank you, Carla. This is the second reading. Obviously, we've had extensive presentations and public testimony on this item. Is there any further business before we call the roll? Seeing none, Carla, please call the roll. Hardesty. Uh, I want to start by really appreciating the very thorough testimony that we received um, in relation to updating the Central City Plan. Um, I'm very mindful that in 1972, which was the very first time we thought about what does downtown Portland look like, um, I suspect that the diversity of participants were a lot different than they are today. Um, as we imagine what Portland Central City will look like in the year 2035, there's some things we know absolutely. What we know is that English probably will not be the primary language spoken in the Central City, in the city of Portland. What we know is that there will be people from 
a whole host of ethnic communities that have never had the privilege. Well, I won't say never had the privilege, but certainly not in 1972 when we started this process, were not actually valued members of the table, I will say. Um, what I know is that uh, people come uh, to what the city of Portland should look like from a lot of different perspectives based on their lived experience. I will tell you that a plan is a document. Um, it is what you do with the document that determines whether or not the plan lives up to the values that you espoused. In my view, we have done a remarkable job of updating the Central City Plan in a way that I hope will lead to a much more equitable outcome by uh, 2035. Um, doesn't mean that our work is done. It doesn't mean that this is the end of the conversation. Uh, we must continue to have this conversation with a whole host of individuals. Um, I, I find it a little ironic that a lot of people's reasoning for not wanting to make changes was uh, because of their belief that there would be a racially disparate outcome. Um, and I have to kind of giggle at that because uh, I don't know if you've been paying attention in the Central City Concern, but uh, we have a traditionally racially disparate outcome in the Central City. And it is my belief that ensuring that every community takes the, op the advantage of growth and the disadvantages of growth equally, I think this plan puts us on the track to do that. Um, and so I am honored and uh, to support uh, this update of the 2035 Central City Plan, and I vote aye. You daily. Well, I supported these changes to the comprehensive plan in 2017, and I still support them. And I want to respond to some of the testimony that we heard a few weeks ago, both for and against readopting the remanded ordinance. I deeply respect the time, energy, and expertise of the members of our Historic Landmarks Commission. My support of the height changes in Old Town Chinatown was in no way meant as, as disregard for the commission. I consider them to be the experts on these issues and the backstop for what can be built in our historic districts. However, I have a different charge than members of the commission. As a city council, we have to weigh issues such as affordable housing and displacement, economic development, and the viability of the business district along with historic preservation considerations. This was the context within which I made my decision. The Old Town Chinatown Historic District is somewhat unique as a historic dis designation as the, sorry, the historic designation is cultural rather than architectural. I wanna make it clear that I absolutely support this historic designation and would not have supported these amendments if I had evidence that development at the proposed heights would threaten the historic designation. I've enjoyed this neighborhood since I was a child. I worked in this neighborhood as a teenager. Members of my extended family, Ruth and Louis Stratikos, did business in this neighborhood and their names are on the Chinatown gateway. And I patronize many businesses in the district to this day. This neighborhood has been struggling for decades. Some successful businesses have recently moved out of the district to relocate elsewhere, and I fear for the recovery of the district post-COVID. Old Town Chinatown needs investment and, de and development, both commercial and residential. Little of either has happened despite the considerably higher height allowances in the previous comprehensive plan. We heard from some community members that affordable housing is not needed or wanted in the historic district. Affordable housing is needed everywhere in our city. More market and luxury rate housing is decidedly not. We have a shortfall of tens of thousands of affordable units and a surplus of market and luxury rate units in the thousands. To be clear, when we were talking about affordable housing and private development, we are talking about units at 60 to 80% of median family income in a city where market rate housing is unaffordable to anyone earning less than 120% of median family income. This is workforce and student housing. This is housing that would be affordable to many of the essential workers who are currently risking their health to serve our community while struggling to afford market rate rents. 
I would have never supported these height changes if I believed they could pose a threat to the Lansu Chinese Garden. I was pleased to hear that Lansu no longer has concerns about potential negative impacts and that the Old Town Community Association also supports readopting the rem remanded ordinance. My intent with supporting the height change adjacent to the garden was to give as much flexibility to the developer as possible on that site, knowing that any negative impact to the garden would require revisions. Finally, I wanna thank everyone who gave testimony in support of our green roof standards. It was my pleasure to work with community advocates and city staff to develop what at the time were the strongest green roof standards in the country. I don't know if that still stands, uh, but thank you to BPS staff <clears throat> for all their hard work on this in partic particular, Joe Zender for taking the time to regularly brief our office. I vote aye. Fritz. The, this is a sad day. Um, the first Central City 2035 plan adopted by the council in 2018 was the culmination of years of robust public process through stakeholder groups in various quadrants and numerous hearings at the Planning and Sustainability Commission and at council. One of the primary reasons I voted no on the original plan and why I vote no today is that the council made a decision to cater at the final hour to a single developer's request for additional height on block 33. This action undermines the careful staff work to explore conflict of interest around zoning changes and height allowances, ensuring that no developer represented on an advisory board was inappropriately rewarded with height increases. If you check the history books, this was a problem. We heard from many proponents of more height in the area who have actual or potential conflicts of interest that were sometimes declared, sometimes not. More significantly, council's decision to increase height on five of the 10 blocks in the new Chinatown, Japantown historic district erodes years of public process and design guidelines to right size the district. I share a core value with my colleagues on the council that we are in need of affordable housing options that serve all Portlanders, particularly those who are low income and at risk of displacement. And I also understand uh, from the Old Town Chinatown Community Association that they also want market rate housing since there's so much low income housing in the district already. As we heard in the testimony in May, out of proportion development threatens the historic and cultural integrity of the new Chinatown Japantown district. In order to be recognized, a historic district has to be large enough with, in, with existing buildings still intact. As we heard from our historic landmarks chair, we're ignoring the most basic principle of design guidelines, which, which, which is compatibility with the original historic buildings. This means we should be measuring massing and height against historically significant buildings, more in the range of one to seven stories, not 15 stories. And on 50 uh, uh, foot um, quarter block lengths rather than the 200 full block length. A 200 foot height allowance will mean that the new construction overwhelms existing quarter block buildings original to the district, some of which are in dire need of repair and restoration. Despite the revised findings, I believe this, this decision erodes the city's investment in the historic Chinese and Japanese American communities in Portland, undermines the role of the Historic Landmarks Commission, is out of compliance with Comprehensive Plan Policy 4.48, and ignores the guiding principles the city adopted for this fragile historic district. I thank Claire Adams Sink, my Senior Policy Director, for her outstanding work on the Comprehensive Plan and Central City 2035 Plan, even while she's currently deployed to the Emergency Coordination Center. I also honor Lindley Reese and Lauren King in City Attorney's Office. It's unfortunate that the findings try to explain how incompatible heights are compatible. It's unfortunate that the City Attorney was asked to justify the, last, the Council's last our decision and that the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability refused to reconsider the, haste, the council's hasty spot zone or to compromise with historic preservationists. Thanks to community members who testified, particularly Kristen Miner and the Historic Landmarks Commissioners, Lynn Fujigami of the Japanese American Cultural Museum, Jackie Peterson of the Portland Chinatown History Foundation, Peggy Moretti of Restore Oregon, and Steve Dottera representing the Architectural Heritage Center. In my opinion, this decision does not honor the Chinese and Jap Japanese heritage of the new Chinatown Japan Town District, no. Wheeler. 
Central City 2035 lays the groundwork for Portland to continue to be a thriving economic, cultural, educational, as well as recreational hub for the region in the coming decades. And if the last several months have taught us anything, it's that change is inevitable. And I noted in an article uh, this morning that uh, uh, talked about some information that had been out there for quite some time, based on median household income, there is not a single neighborhood in the city of Portland that an African-American family can afford to live in. Not a single neighborhood. So when we start talking about other important values, for me, sort of a baseline question is, uh, are those things important if our city is not accessible by all of the people who actually want to live here? And so that is also something that's on my mind. This is a balancing act. There was nothing easy about this, balancing the needs for housing, the needs for cultural and educational and recreational opportunities, balancing the needs for uh, an economy that doesn't just benefit the few that are fortunate enough to be able to live in this city, but actually thinks about prosperity as something that can be shared broadly amongst all members of the community uh, not only today, but in terms of where we think this community is going to be in the years ahead. The plan, I believe, uh, is a bold one. It carries on the tradition of previous plans that resulted in transforming Harbor Drive into Waterfront Park, uh, a parking garage into what is now Pioneer Courthouse Square, sometimes referred to as Portland's living room, and of course, Brownfields into the Pearl District and the South Waterfront. What this plan does differently is that it sets the stage for a vibrant, equitable, and healthy city core. The plan helps us realize our goals for more affordable housing, yes, but also increased resilience in the face of climate change and economic recession, and better jobs and more of them thinking more broadly about who can gain access to those jobs. In other words, we've really broadened the scope of planning in the city through this central city plan. The plan proposes a mix of old and new industry in the central east side, stronger safeguards of our iconic scenic views, and a deeper focus on our greatest natural feature, one that has been far too long neglected, the Willamette River. During this re-adoption, we heard a lot of testimony about the effect of this plan on the, Japan, the Chinatown, Japantown district. The council finds that the evidence presented was not persuasive to show that the Pacific Tower and increased height in the district had or will have adverse effects. And we see the Pacific Tower supporting the preservation of nearby historic resources by returning residential living to the district, filling in the street wall, using the consistent exterior materials, and now increasing the potential for nearby contributing resources to achieve economic viability for both rehabilitation as well as reuse. I wanna thank everyone who's been part of the 2035 process over many years. I also wanna thank the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for guiding the city through this thorough planning process over the years from a basic concept plan to quadrant plans to the initial adoption and now this re-adoption of the overall plan. And particularly, I want to express my gratitude to Andrea Durbin, who is at the ECC this week, and her team, Joe Zender, Rachel Hoy, Troy Doss, Mindy Brooks, Debbie Bischoff, Brandon Spencer Hartle, Nicholas Starin, Mark Raggett, and Sally Edmonds for their incredible and hard work shepherding the original process, as well as this re-adoption process. I also want to thank city attorneys, Lynn Lee Reese and Lauren King, for their guidance and continued attention to detail throughout this process. And finally, Kristen Dennis, Tia Williams, Cupid Alexander, and Mustafa Washington on my staff for their hard work. Uh, I voted aye on this previously. I'm happy to vote aye on it again. I vote aye, the ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Next item is the consent agenda. Has any item been pulled off of the consent agenda? Uh, yes, Mayor, we've had a request for 525. 525, let me just circle that there, Carla. 
Um, and could we please uh, call the roll on the remainder of the consent agenda? Hardesty? Aye. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. Now we'll return to the regular agenda. Carla, could you please read item number 531? Hmm. Adopt emergency temporary limitations on the fees third party delivery services may charge restaurants during the COVID 19 emergency. Excellent. Thank you. Commissioner Udaly, why don't you kick us off on this, please? Sure. So, uh, Carla, first of all, I'd like to move to accept the substitute exhibit A sent out in the Tuesday memo. Second. Thank you. My senior policy advisor, before, Andreas. Before, before you do your open, why don't we, so I don't forget, why don't we have, vote on the substitute? We, I think we were wanting to receive testimony before. Oh, okay, very good. Thought, Sorry. Correct. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, my senior policy advisor, Andreas, will be providing more context for this amendment during his presentation. So if it's all right with everyone, we'll wait to vote on the amendment until after testimony. I'll now turn it over to Mayor Wheeler, who has graciously agreed to co-sponsor this with me before I give my opening remarks. Thank you. In, in case anybody wonders, Commissioner Udaly and I did not make the dress rehearsal for this earlier today. Uh, so thank you, Commissioner Udaly. I'm proud to co-sponsor this item. And of course, I've heard directly from dozens of people in the restaurant industry about their struggles to keep their businesses afloat. Uh, in addition to the fact that all of their customers uh, are asked to stay home, we've heard of the immense disadvantage that these delivery apps present for a restaurant's ability to stay in business. I've asked the community to help us identify the unique ways that the Portland City Council can support our local small businesses, and this rose to the top. And I hope to have uh, all of our support on this because it's truly important. And with that, Commissioner Udaly, I'll turn it over to you to invite up our panel. Thank you, Mayor. I'm very excited to introduce this ordinance. In response to calls from our Asian Pacific Islander and restaurant communities, we are proposing the strongest COVID protections for restaurants in the country. Local restaurants are a vital community asset that, of course, provide food and jobs and contribute to the culture of our city. This ordinance protects restaurants who are suffer struggling during COVID by setting fee caps on third-party companies. Caps are set at two tiers. A 5% cap if the order is delivered by the restaurant or picked up by the customer, or a 10% cap if the third party company delivers this order, delivers the order. Here to present on the ordinance is my senior policy advisor, Andreas Oswell. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. For the record, Andres Oswell, Senior Policy Advisor for Commissioner Chloe Udaly. We developed this ordinance with the PANO and the Portland Independent Restaurant Alliance. These are trusted community partners who have raised concerns about the fees restaurants are charged by third-party food platforms during Prosper Portland's COVID listening session. These organizations work firsthand with restaurants struggling to stay afloat during the COVID pandemic and economic crisis. Here to present some of the qualitative firsthand experience of restaurants in the Jade District is Jenny Lee, Pano's Advocacy Director. Good morning. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mayor, Commissioners, Andres, for the opportunity to test, uh, speak with you this morning. My name is Jenny Lee, um, and I'm here, um, and also a registered lobbyist with the City of Portland, speaking on behalf of Apano. So virtually every Portlander treasures our food scene, but for BIPOC and immigrant residents, our restaurants are essential anchors of community. They are gathering places for families and elders, they serve the food we grew up eating, and they create wealth, jobs, and economic opportunity. Right now, it's these cultural and community assets that are at imminent risk of closure. Apano is based out of the Jade District, the heart of Portland's Chinese and Vietnamese immigrant communities. With the pandemic, we have already suffered losses of irreplaceable community anchors, such as Wong's King, the site of so many family gatherings and celebrations for Chinese Portlanders. And I'm sure many of you here today share some of these memories. 
We need to be sure that our remaining restaurants have a fighting chance at making it through this crisis, and we have an opportunity to do that today. If our businesses fail and leave, the community will leave as well. Protecting our local restaurants is a critical anti-displacement strategy. We are grateful for the investments that the city has already made in our local businesses, and this ordinance is the next step we need to keep these restaurants afloat. At Apano, we advise small businesses in the neighborhood, and we have heard countless stories. Um, just one of our clients, Pure Spice, is representative of many of these. Owner Chinghua Tan faces delivery fees of 25 to 30 percent, and as a result, she can barely pay her rent, her food costs, or her workers. Other restaurants have tried and simply have not been able to scrape by. They've exhausted themselves by attempting to prepare and deliver food themselves, and this is simply not sustainable. Their only option is to close, hopefully just for now, to stop losing money. Other Jade District restaurants have considered signing up for delivery services, hoping for a way to survive, but found that there was no way to break even given the fees. And it's not just the Jade District. BIPOC businesses more broadly are some of the most impacted, and their closures will represent some of our city's deepest losses. They have the least bargaining power with these platforms because they often serve meals that are affordable to many Portlanders. And these are the same businesses already facing systemic inequities, as they are the most shut out of white dominant systems of banking, access to capital, and government assistance programs. It's up to our city to ensure that out-of-state corporations can't take advantage of the desperation of our small business owners. We can't risk relying on the benevolence of these platforms during a crisis. These delivery systems are indeed an important service, and that's all the more reason that we need balanced regulations that level the playing field during this pandemic. By passing this ordinance, you will help establish a lifeline for these important cultural assets. Thank you for your consideration of this measure and your ongoing commitment to supporting Portland's BIPOC and immigrant-owned small businesses, and that we hope that you will take action today. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Next, to share more on the quantitative reality of Portland restaurants is Katie Connor, an organizer with the Portland Independent Restaurant Alliance. Thank you so much, Andreas. Hello, my name is Katie Connors. Thank you for the council for having me here today on behalf of the Portland Independent Restaurant Alliance. We would also like to thank Commissioner Udaly's office for working with us and Apano for supporting us every single step of the way. To local small restaurants in the city, this ordinance represents a potential path of survival. We understand the extremity of this crisis. Every day we are witnessing restaurants of every kind close indefinitely and we expect the number of closures to grow exponentially in the coming months as PPP money runs out and as diners decrease, as unemployment rises. The Independent Restaurant Coalition performed a study recently that found that 85% of independent restaurants may not survive this crisis. We need your help. We support this emergency measure taken by the state and the city to protect our communities. One of the first actions PIRA took as a group was to ask Governor Kate Brown to close our dining rooms. We understand that the safety of the community and our teams is dependent on the limits set on on-premise dining. But we need another sustainable source of revenue to allow us to continue serving the Portland community. From the data that we have collected, we have found that businesses using delivery services are paying an average of 25 to 30% on commission on every transaction ordered through these platforms. Most of them have not been able to negotiate these commissions successfully. And even though there are temporary measures taken by these companies to help during the peak of the COVID-19 crisis, most of these measures of lower commissions are now expired. Since the expiration of these lower rate rates, many restaurants have opted out of delivery completely because they simply cannot afford the commission. We understand that delivery services are essential at this time and want to be able to offer it to our guests, but not at the expense of the sustainability of our businesses. Right now, every sale counts, every dollar counts. And data collected by Wompley, who is tracing transactions at open restaurants and bars to document the effect of the economic crisis, it was found that Multnomah County restaurant sales are down by an average of 77% compared to the same time last year. At the end of Q1, Uber Eats national gross bookings were up by 52% compared to last year for a gross profit of $4.68 billion. On July 6th, it was stated by the company that they were up more than 100% in bookings year to year. 
We understand their need to come out against this ordinance. They are beholden to their stockholders and therefore must fight every chance that their market value may dip. To th these third-party, multi-billion-dollar companies, this is business as usual. We are fighting in favor of this ordinance because this business environment is anything but usual. Without the cap on these commission fees, the greed of out-of-town corporations will forever damage the vitality of Portland's independent businesses. If the council takes action now and delivers a fee cap, you will not only support the restaurants of the city, you'll be supporting our teams, our landlords, and our suppliers. We are stronger together. Thank you so much for considering this. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. As partners, Apano and Pira helped us understand the dire situation that Portland restaurants are in and the role that third-party fees play in this. We've tracked policies as they developed in other cities, but this ordinance was not developed until local restaurants began calling for a cap independently. Following the lead of other cities, we worked with our partners to develop an emergency ordinance using the strongest components of other cities' protections with an eye to cities similar in size to Portland. Keelan, if you could pull up the presentation. And just let me know once it's up. Keelan, did you hear that? Carla, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is Keelan. I'm I'm trying to pull it up. Sorry, just a moment. No worries. Thank you. There we go. Perfect. And if we could move on to the next slide. Perfect. Because of COVID, many restaurants, including longtime Portland establishments, may not survive this crisis. The threat, as Jenny put it, is most dire for BIPOC-owned businesses. The virulent nature of the pandemic has led restaurants to rely, to rely on delivery and pickup services as restrictions and consumer confidence have decimated their ability to provide dine-in service. While there have been some concessions offered by platforms, these discounts have largely ended while the pandemic continues to increase in severity. Existing agreements charge restaurants up to 30% or more per order which is unsustainable for most restaurants operating on a thin profit margin. Next slide. Sorry, one before that. There we go. In response to the feedback from the Portland Business Alliance, Uber Eats, and DoorDash, we have added an amendment which creates a lower cap for companies that do not include delivery service for an order. In conversation with these delivery companies, they brought to our attention that some platforms allow customers to pick up an order or the restaurant's own delivery team might complete the order. In the interest of creating a level playing field, we're adding a 5% cap for orders where the third party does not include delivery service. Next slide. So with our amendment, this ordinance sets two tracks for the fees the restaurant is charged. If the order is not delivered by the third party, then the most they can charge the restaurant is 5% of the order. If the order is delivered by the third party, then the most they can charge is 10% of the order. Further, the ordinance prevents restaurants from reducing compensation to delivery drivers because of the cap and sets a $500 penalty per restaurant per day to restaurant to platforms that violate this ordinance. The protection would be in effect for the length of the COVID emergency and for 90 days after. The approach is responsive to the reality of restaurants. Until Portland restaurants are able to open completely and customers feel safe returning to an unrestricted dine-in experience, restaurants will continue to be reliant on pickup and delivery orders and these caps will be necessary for restaurants to stay open. 
Before turning it over to public testimony, I want to be clear about one thing. This ordinance has been introduced for the sole purpose of protecting Portland's cherished restaurants and the crucial role that they play as employers, food providers, and local businesses. As Jenny and Katie have presented, these regulations are desperately needed, and we're happy to answer any questions you have about them. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Andres, could you could you do me a favor on uh, the substitute that Commissioner Udaley put forward? That is a substitute. That is an amendment. Is that correct? That is correct. It replaces Exhibit A. In, in narrowest terms, describe what that amendment does relative to the original, to the base ordinance. Yes. So the substance of it is adding the 5% cap for companies where the customer is picking up or the restaurant is delivering. It also makes minor language changes to clarify and avoid confusion about which platforms we're referring to. Very good. Thank you. All right, if there's no further discussion, we'll go to public testimony. Carla, how many people do we have signed up? Um, we had two people, but I only see one right now. All right. Rebe I'm sorry, Rebecca Cordia. All right, welcome, Rebecca. Three minutes, please. Name for the record. Hi, good morning, members morning. of the City Council. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Hi. My name is Rebecca Cordia. Um, I'm a Portland resident and a delivery worker for DoorDash. I would like to address the council today to express my concern about their proposal to limit fees that delivery companies can charge restaurants. So I recently just moved to Portland from St. Louis, Missouri after finishing my master's degree in speech language pathology. But um, as we know, COVID hit, so this kind of disrupted my job search and I need extra money to help pay bills and kind of help my fiance with groceries. So I found DoorDash a good way to make that extra cash. Um, although the job search has honestly been a roller coaster, um, being a delivery driver worker has provided me with a steady stream of income during the really challenging time. So one of the most beneficial, beneficial parts of being a deli delivery worker is that I can pick um, my own hours and I can turn on and off the app whenever I need to so I can continue to do search for full-time work and to complete the process that I need to obtain my licensure to start my CFY year, my CF year in speech language pathology when I'm not driving. So I feel like I've made a decent amount of money that I will likely keep doing this work after I get a full-time job, um, whenever I'm not working at my job. Um, and I feel like I'm doing the community a service by being able to, to deliver right now because I honestly have been delivering to a lot of elderly people, going grocery shopping for them, who are not able to do so themselves, so I'm providing them meals. Um, so like uh, many other people, I need this income right now to make ends meet. And any kind of law like this one that the city council is proposing to put a limit on the amount that delivery companies can charge restaurants for delivery services would directly hurt workers like me. So the fees that you're trying to cap go directly to paying delivery workers and I can't afford to lose out on much needed income because of a law that would actually do more harm than good, mostly during time, times like these. So thank you for considering people like me before you vote. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony, Rebecca. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Is there any further discussion on this item? We will vote on the amendment first then. Carla, please call the roll on Commissioner Udaley's amendment. Hardesty? Aye. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. To the main motion, please. 531 as amended, please call the roll. Hardesty? This appears to be a really good uh, measure, especially during COVID-19. Uh, my only pause is the young woman who just spoke in public testimony. I hope that we will be monitoring to make sure that drivers are not the ones that are um, um, negatively impacted by this policy. I absolutely think it's a it, it, it must uh, we must pass this, but I am concerned 
that uh, corporations find ways to make sure that somebody else suffers the loss. So I will vote yes today, but I will be working with uh, 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 Commissioner Udaly's office to ensure that there are no unintended consequences from this action. And I want to say to the young woman who spoke, um, please bring directly to our attention if there's any change in your economic situation based on this action. I think many times people try to scare their employees into believing the change will negatively impact them. And so I don't have, I have more trust in, um, in, uh, in the restaurants than I do right now in the corporations that, uh, that, that are trying to take advantage of this situation. So I'm very happy to vote aye. You daily? Well, I'd, I'd also like to thank the woman who um, came to give testimony today and assure you that we definitely have workers in mind when we uh, crafted this item. And it includes a provision that compensation to drivers cannot be reduced. Um, but I do have to say, if your business model is predicated, predicated on gouging your clients and underpaying workers, you need to find a new business model. So as much as I'm concerned about uh, these drivers and all people who are relying on the gig economy to earn a living, we can't allow these companies to, to run unchecked and price gouge and exploit during a crisis, and that is what you're responding to. Um, I want to give a shout out to a few, a couple local options, Beeline Urban Delivery and CCC, which is a, another bicycle delivery service. Uh, if multinational corporations can't make this work, maybe we can make delivery work uh, on a local level. Um, so I have a number of people I want to thank first. Uh, first, my senior policy advisor, Andreas Oswell, for his quick work moving this in the past two weeks. This is his first uh, council presentation since joining my office. We nabbed Andreas from the Housing Bureau. Sorry, Director Callahan, not sorry. Um, thank you to Prosper Star. Yeah, Prosper staff for elevating this issue raised in your listening sessions, Jamie Dumphy and the mayor's office for all your support, and Adrian Delcado and Naomi Sheffield in the city attorney's office who worked on this around the clock to move it forward quickly. Most importantly, I want to thank Apano and the Portland Independent Restaurant Alliance for your partnership in developing this ordinance. We could not have done this without you, so thank you. This policy represents the strongest local protections for restaurants during COVID. This protection lasts 90 days beyond the declared COVID-19 emergency. Even after restaurants are able to open at full capacity, they will continue to be over-reliant on third-party orders until customers feel safe going back to dine in at pre-pandemic levels. For restaurants on razor-thin margins, this provides much-needed relief. It prevents food delivery costs from being offloaded on to the businesses that make the food and ensures that driver compensation rates are not reduced. This ordinance will help ensure that local restaurants stay open, keep people employed, and continue to contributing to Portland's economy. I'm very happy to vote aye. Great. Well, I'm very glad that we are finally um, recognizing that these companies that just provide an online platform and um, then benefit off the work of the people who prepare the food and the people who deliver the food are getting um, some restrictions put on how much they can gouge both parties. And so I, I honor Commissioner you daily and Andres and your staff for bringing this to council quickly. Um, as an elderly shut-in person, I've been very grateful to the local restaurants, well, and I'm fortunate that I have a son that can uh, pick up for, for us with some of the local restaurants and also one where I can walk and they bring the food out outside uh, to put in my bag for me. Um, so other people don't have that um, ability to, to do that. And so we're grateful to the drivers and appreciate that they uh, need to make ends meet as well. I. Um, 
like my colleagues will want to hear from drivers. My suspicion, as I know, is what um, isn't the intent of the ordinance. I, I would imagine that the a lot more restaurants are going to opt in now that they can actually yeah, make a profit rather than um, basically making pennies if 30% is going to the company. And I, I'd be willing to bet that 30% does not go to the delivery person. I do hope that um, people will pay attention to this ordinance and recognize that the delivery people are providing a vital service and tip them generously. Also tip your um, restaurant as if you were eating in. And um, thank you to all of the businesses who um, are so vital to our economy and frankly to my diet for uh, not, not having to eat the same thing day after day. Aye. Wheeler. I want to thank Commissioner Udaly and her team for this great work. I'm proud to co-sponsor this item, and I want to thank the members of my team who are engaged as well. I believe this is perfectly in line with how other cities across the nation are helping their restaurants to get through this crisis. We are directly responding to the police and the needs of small businesses here in the city of Portland, and we're supporting the local restaurant industry through this time of crisis, and uh, also, I believe, protecting the incomes of delivery drivers. We're leading with Portland values. I think this makes a lot of sense. I'm proud to vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you all. Next up is item number 532, please. Appoint Kimberly Horner to the Portland Housing Advisory Commission for a term to expire July 7, 2022. Director Callahan, good morning. You're muted. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Shannon Callahan of the Portland Housing Bureau. It is my true pleasure um, to ask for your support uh, to support Kimberly Horner um, on the Portland Housing Advisory Commission. Uh, Kimberly currently serves as the Executive Director for Portland Community Reinvestment Initiatives, or PCRI, a culturally specific affordable housing developer and service provider serving the Black community, primarily in North and Northeast Portland. Ms. Horner's experience in economic development, local government, and affordable housing, blended with her commitment to advancing equitable outcomes for the BIPOC community, makes her an excellent candidate for the commission, and I am very grateful that she is willing to commit her time and expertise to the Housing Bureau and the city through the Portland Housing Advisory Commission. I also believe that um, Kimberly is on the call this morning. Um, uh, for any council members who, um, or if she would like to say a few words, or if council members would like to um, talk to Ms. Horner themselves. Good morning, Kimberly. Anybody have any questions or thoughts for Kimberly? Or Kimberly, did you want to say a few words? I just want to say good morning. Um, I wholeheartedly uh, welcome the opportunity to participate on uh, this committee, and I am very grateful that the city and uh, Shannon has looked at me as a person that should be appointed to the committee and I hope to serve the committee well. Um, what a little about me, I grew up in the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, my father was the former mayor of Thousand Oaks for several terms and my upbringing was spent going to city council meetings. From there, I began work in um, federal government working for Congressman Brad Sherman and then after that, I started work for the city of Oxnard, uh, starting as an intern and finishing my career as the economic development director. So I believe that my experience in um, local and federal government will help me bring some good contributions to the committee, as well as the good work that we're doing at PCRI. So if anyone has questions for me at this time, I'm happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, thank you for the appointment. Very good, Kimberly. We're, we're glad to have you here. Commissioner Fritz has her hand raised. Uh, thank you for being willing to serve. I was just wondering, uh, where is Dalton Oaks? Dalton Oaks is in Southern California. It's about 40 minutes north of Los Angeles. It's on your way to Santa Barbara. Um, many people know Thousand Oaks as one of the safest cities in the United States, um, and it's been noted for that for many, many years. My daughter lives down there. I bet she's heard of it. Thank you very much, and thank you again for being willing to serve. 
Thank you. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, Kimberly. I just wanted to say welcome, and oh my gosh, with your background, it sounds uh, fascinating that you are in affordable housing. How did that happen? When we, uh, when I worked in city government for the city of Oxnard, we were typically that agency as the redevelopment agency to provide the financing to developers to build affordable housing. And I believe the state of California made a very big mistake when they ended redevelopment throughout the state of California to shore up a $30 billion shortfall that California had back in 2011. When they did that, um, it eliminated a lot of the provisions that were available, particularly the tax increment, um, the housing set aside piece that allowed for redevelopment agencies to pair with developers to get affordable housing built. So that was my experience um, working for the city of Oxnard and in housing. And it's always been a big interest of mine, particularly providing uh, clean, decent living standards for black people and people of color. Well, Kimberly, we are lucky to have you. So thank you for your willingness to serve uh, the city of Portland. Um, one day we won't be meeting by virtual reality. And I would love, I bet you've got stories. I'd love to have coffee and, and find out more about uh, your, your story. Uh, please, welcome. I've been tracking your career too, and you're, I very much look forward to having that coffee with you, even if it's virtual. But, but yes, I have tracked your career, and it's been a phenomenal career ride that you've had as well. So, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Kimberly. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Very good. Any further discussion? Carla, please. Or actually, is this a uh, this is a report, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion from Commissioner Hardesty, second from Commissioner Udaly. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Carla, please call the roll. Hardesty? Aye. Udaly? Well, I'm very grateful for your willingness to vol volunteer your time and expertise to PHAC, uh, Director Horner, and I vote aye. Fritz? <laughs> Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here today. It's nice to meet you even virtually. And thank you for the time that you'll invest on the commission. It is significant and important, and I hope you find it very satisfying. Aye. Wheeler. Thank you, Kimberly, for your willingness to serve. This is obviously an important commission. It's our primary forum for the discussion of affordable housing policy, strategy, resources. Uh, so the experience that you bring from PCRI as well as your prior experience is critically important. And I look forward to both your insights and your guidance as a commissioner on this important commission. Uh, couldn't be happier that you're stepping forward. And uh, we look forward to many years of uh, service and leadership on your part. I vote aye. The report's accepted. The appointment's approved. Thanks, Kimberly. Next item is 533, please. Authorize a competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Columbia Boulevard Wastewater Treatment Plant Organic Waste Receiving Facility Project number E10804 for an estimated amount of $7,821,000. Colleagues, the Environmental Services operates the Columbia Boulevard wastewater treatment plant in North Portland, which turns wastewater into a variety of renewable resources, including biogas. This project today is a partnership with Metro. Environmental services will take food waste collected by Metro that would otherwise go into the landfill and instead send it to the city's main wastewater treatment plant. It will reduce the amount of food that goes into landfills on one hand, and it'll increase the amount of biogas that BES can produce as renewable energy on the other. Here today to present the project is Paul Sudo. He's the engineering manager and Jeff Mogg, project manager, and both of them are from Environmental Services. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Mayor Wheeler, for the introduction. Um, 
and commissioners. Um, for the record, my name is Paul Sudo, engineering manager with BES. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick intro here that this is a project we've been working on for a few years now. It's an exciting project where BES is continuing efforts to leverage the city's uh, Columbia Boulevard wastewater treatment plant to increase uh, renewable energy opportunities. And in particular for th this project to recover um, waste streams essentially to produce more um, energy at the plant and for the community. So uh, Jeff Mogg is here um, and he will lead the presentation and I will be here to uh, answer any questions. I also wanna highlight that um, uh, Holly Sternkorb from uh, Metro is also here attending um, if there's any Metro specific questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and members of the council. For the record, my name is Jeff Mogg and I'm project manager for the Organic Waste Receiving Facility. Gonna start a presentation here. All right, uh, Metro has implemented regulations to reduce commercial food waste going to landfill and plans on collecting it and processing it into liquid food waste at the Metro Central Transfer Station. This commercial food waste consists of food scraps and expired food products, such as produce, bread, meats, and dairy. It will be turned into a liquid with the consistency of a smoothie delivered by tanker truck to the plant. We will also be allowing deliveries of fats, oils, and grease from haulers that service grease traps at food service establishments, such as restaurants and grocery store delis. The project provides a significant opportunity to increase biogas production. The bugs and the digesters basically eat this food and produce more biogas. The increase in biogas results in more renewable energy that displaces purchased natural gas and electricity. The increased renewable energy production at the plant supports city climate action plan goals. And this photo here shows a truck unloading at Gresham's Fats, Oils and Grease receiving station, which has been operated successfully since 2012. Biogas will be used to generate renewable energy, electricity and heat, for the wastewater treatment plant operation, which will result in substantial savings over utility costs annually. Fats, oils, and grease haulers on Metro will be charged by the gallon for any load that they deliver to the system. Fats, oils, and grease comes from grease traps at food service establishments. In this slide, you can, or in this picture, you can see um, looking down into the grease trap through the maintenance hatch, you can see that there's a baffle that prevents the uh, grease from the kitchen going into the sewer system itself. And these grease traps are typically cleaned quarterly. If the fats, oils, and grease are not removed, it ends up in the collection system where it causes plugs and overflows. This photo shows an example of typical food waste. Um, this is produce, rotten produce, and then uh, past date tubs of dairy products. The new metro regulations will result in the recovery of 50,000 tons of food waste that will be directed to the wastewater treatment plant each year. The regulations are being phased in over three and a half year period, and they will first affect businesses generating 1,000 pounds a week, then those generating 500 pounds a week, and finally, by September 2023, any business generating over 250 pounds per week will be required to separate their food scraps. We have a memorandum of understanding in place with Metro at this time for mutual development of a commercial food waste processing system. It defines roles and responsibilities, timelines, and communication protocols. An intragovernmental agreement is expected to be completed by the end of the year. Metro is currently starting the design process for the facility at this time. And this picture shows a typical truck that will be used to deliver the food waste and fats, oils, and grease to the organic food, the organic waste receiving facility at the wastewater treatment plant. 
Here's an overview of the system. Um, these are the existing digesters at the plant, and then this is Portland Road right up here. The system's going to be constructed in two sections. The purple side is for the food waste, and then the orange side is for the fat soils and grease. Combined, the system has five tanks. Each tank is 21 feet in diameter and about 15 feet tall. And then there's pumps to unload the trucks, mix the tanks, and feed the digesters. It also has an odor control system for the benefit of workers and neighbors. The digesters are fed slowly um, 24 hours a day to maintain stable operation and a steady supply of biogas. The biogas is used as fuel in the cogen engines over in this building here to produce a lot renewable electricity and heat for use at the plant. Or the biogas is burned in the um, boilers over here in the digester complex to provide heat at the plant. There's a triple win with this system. Approximately 10,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent will be eliminated each year. This is the equivalent to the carbon footprint of about 150 homes. The system strongly supports the city, city's climate action plan goals for reducing carbon emissions through diversion of food waste and generation of renewable energy. Annual revenue is projected to be about $1.2 million with a payback target of 10 years. Revenue comes from tip fees, reduced electrical and natural gas bills, and synergy with the renewable natural gas system currently completing construction. There are also clean air benefits. Emissions and associated toxins from diesel vehicles will be reduced because of reduced haul distances. Also, there will be less use of natural gas and grid electricity. The construction contract is estimated to be about $7.8 million, and the total budget is about $10.6 million. The level of confidence on these numbers is moderate, and the schedule shown here coincides with Metro's schedule to complete their new facility. And with that, I'm done with the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, are there any questions for us? Colleagues, any questions? Uh, Commissioner Fritz has her hand up. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, thank you for the presentation. I understood Commissioner Fish's cherished poop to power program because with the um, solid waste from the wastewater treatment plant, that um, methane is going to need to be otherwise burned if it wasn't turned into um, liquid natural gas. And I also somewhat understand turning the fat soils and grease into natural gas for use in the energy. The food scraps could be composted and wouldn't that be less um, impactful to the environment? Um. Uh, great question, uh, Commissioner Fritz. I think um, what we found, I, I think, in the industry is that um, uh, actually anaerobic digestion provides a more sound environmental solution than composting. For one thing, um, it reduces truck trips, so you don't have to haul. Typically, composting is over, they have to be in more kind of rural areas due to all the space requirements. And uh, you miss out on recovering the energy uh, from it. Because um, composting is typically an aerobic process, whereas the digestion process we use at the Columbia Boulevard treatment plant is anaerobic, so it's a, it's a different type of bacteria, so it tends to produce methane for us that we can beneficially use. So, but head to head, the um, environmental footprint has tipped more toward um, being more centralized and toward anaerobic digestion. Thank you. That was a, an interesting answer. Also, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that not all of the food scraps are going into this process. Um, in other words, I mean, the advantage to the compost is that then it can be used on the ground to, to grow food, more food. So um, will there still be plenty of uh, food waste going into the composting system? 
Yeah, uh, that's our, our, our understanding. So um, um, one key thing there is uh, we didn't get into the, the nitty gritty specifically. Um, this is targeted toward um, uh, a lot of like uh, commercial establishments. So we'll still have the um, residential program, of, uh, the food waste to compost um, with, the, with the mixed lawn clippings. So that program will still continue. Um, so it, from our understanding, there's, there's plenty of this waste to go around, so to speak. So it's, it's just going to be a, a portion, a portion of the uh, waste stream that will be harnessed. And, um, it's basically, it's, it's a remaining fraction that's still going to the landfills. So the compo, this won't, um, to restate, this won't change the current program where the residential program of, um, composting. Did that answer your question? Got it. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> Any further questions, colleagues, before we move to public testimony? Mayor, Carly, sorry? Mayor, yeah. I'm sorry, Mayor. I had a question. My hand's up. I'm sorry. Thank you. No worry. Uh, Paul, thank you for that presentation. Um, there's a lot of food waste in multifamily apartment complexes because we haven't figured out how to do composting there yet. It, what is the, what's the plan? Uh, because uh, uh, if we're talking about really um, uh, having the best bang for the buck, I, I think that we are missing a whole demographic group that would compost if it was made easy for people to be able to do that. Uh, but there's certainly no way, easy way to do that in a multifamily apartment complex. Uh, great question, Commissioner Hardesty. I don't have the answer to that. I agree that that would be a great um, opportunity. I, I kind of maybe pull Holly Sternkorb into this uh, from Metro if she can uh, speak to that specific point because I'm I know Metro has looked at, you know, where, where to focus their uh, recovery efforts. Yeah, because we pay a small fortune, we just don't get any of the economic benefits of paying a small fortune and uh, for garbage pickup. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hardesty, for that question. And I think, thank you for the opportunity to be here to represent uh, Metro's partnership on this project. Um, regarding food scraps collection at multifamily, uh, that is something that is being worked on. So you'll, we'll be seeing this over, over time, having that added on to uh, multifamily collection programs. Is there any analysis on what people are being charged for this service as compared to the benefits of the service that they're getting? It appears that there's not a standard charge in multifamily apartment dwellings. Is that an accurate statement, Holly? Uh, it is, and questions about actual collection costs um, uh, really should be directed to the city, the Bureau of um, uh, Sustainability and Planning. The uh, garbage haulers collect the food waste and yeah, set the set the rates for commercial. So I, I really can't I, I can't address the question on on rates charged at multifamily. Well, it, it impacts what service you get, right? So I, I so there is a connection. I, I I hear you that you aren't the one to respond to that. Thank you. Very good, Carla. Is there public testimony on this island? I don't. No one signed up, Mayor. Very good. Anything else before I send this on? Not seeing anything. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you all. Next item, 534, please. Authorize the Bureau of Environmental Services to acquire certain permanent and temporary property rights necessary for construction of the Goose Hollow Sewer Rehabilitation Project E10683 through the exercise of the city's eminent domain authority. Colleagues, in May, the city council unanimously approved the Goose Hollow Sewer Rehabilitation Project to repair and replace about two miles of sewer pipes in southwest Portland. The project is designed to minimize construction impacts to the properties and to upgrade the sewer system to better protect public health properties and the environment. To accomplish these project goals and to keep the project on schedule, the city needs to acquire certain property rights. Here today with a brief presentation are Joe Dvorak, engineering manager, 
and Yun Zhang, project manager, both with the Bureau of Environmental Services. Joe and Young, please take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor and members of Council. For the record, my name is Joe Dvorak with DES. Uh, the Goose Hollow Project is one of many in our large-scale sewer rehabilitation program. Um, the last remaining piece of engineering for this project is to obtain permanent and temporary construction easements. Young has prepared a very brief presentation with more details, and then we're also available at the end if you have any questions. Young? Uh, thank you, Joe, and good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. And for the record, uh, I'm Yang Zhang with BES, the project manager for this project. Uh, so today we'll just give you a brief overview of the uh, uh, sewer easement we acquired for the project uh, to complete the construction of the, uh, of the sewer repair. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as just you mentioned, it's you know uh, this project was presented to the uh, uh, council uh, two months ago uh, for uh, uh, authorize, authorization of the low bid. Um, so the project uh, includes about the uh, fifty deteriorated pipe, and which are uh, in fifty to over one hundred years old in the Goose Hollow and the Southwest Hills neighborhoods. Uh, among those 50 pipes, so, so there are two pipes that we don't, the city has no sewer easement. So uh, on this slide, so on the right side of this map, so we show where those two pipes are. So one is in the Goose Hollow neighborhood, um, there's near Washington Park, and the other, the other one is in the Southwest Hills neighborhood. So for the sewer, uh, so sewer easement is needed for construction as pipe on those private property. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> So here is a summary of uh, those two pipe locations on the private property and the proposed the construction method, as well as the public outreach out, uh, uh, activities. Uh, as shown from aerial view, and you can see those two pipes highlighted in red are crossing the private property. And those two pipes is next to the property line between the two neighboring property. So unfortunately we don't have the Eastman had in either of those property. Um, so in order to rehabilitate those pipes, uh, we propose to use the uh, cute in-place pipe. It's called CIPP. This is the uh, trendless method. They will be minimized the impact to the property owner. And also we need to use the small repair method to repair the broken parts of the pipe as we need it in this property. Um, Besides mailing, you know, uh, to all the residents on this private property about the projects, and the BS public involvement team has directly contacted the property uh, property owners about the planned construction scope. Um, no, uh, no opposition was received uh, with the project moving forward, and our uh, PI team will continue the outreach to property owners for access needs and the easement requirements and the project schedule. Uh, so next slide, please. So here is a summary of what we needed for sewer easement. So uh, acquired easement needed to be approximately 15 feet wide as this pipe is next to the property line between two neighboring property. So this easement will cross the two properties. So totally we need easement in four property. Um, so this size is required for construction and also for long-term the maintenance, require, uh, maintenance needs. The cost of the easement in this property will be determined by the independent appraisal uh, during the eminent domain process after this gets approved. Um, so project design was completed in June and the project was advertised last week. So it is anticipated the project construction will start in November this year. So we pray for to uh, acquire the position of those uh, sewer easement by early November. So that's what I have for today. Um, any questions? Very good, colleagues, any follow-up questions? Carla, is there any public testimony on this item? No one signed up for this item, Mayor. All right, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you for the presentation.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, although I'm going to pull it back, could you read item 535, please? Mm -hmm. Authorize grant agreement up to $73,000 to Southwest Neighborhoods, Inc. to provide outreach, technical assistance, and community involvement for watershed projects in West, in West Side sub watersheds. After discussions with the Bureau and my team, I'm going to pull this back to my office. Next item is 536. Accept guaranteed maximum price of $17,989,637 from MWH Constructors, Inc. for the construction of the Corrosion Control Improvements Project. This procurement report is for a Water Bureau Bull Run treatment project that will construct a corrosion control treatment facility at the Bureau's Lusted Hill facility. The project will protect public health by controlling the corrosion of lead and copper plumbing materials into drinking water. We have Chief Procurement Officer Lester Spittler here to present the report. Good morning, Lester. How are you today? Good morning, Mayor Wheeler. I'm doing well. Thank you. Great. Um, Commissioner Fritz, do you have any talking points that you wanted to go through? No, thank you. I'm just available for questions later. Okay, thank you. So Michelle Cheek and I from the Water Bureau are going to present on this item. Michelle is going to share a presentation with Council. Let's see Wait. if I can do this. Success? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Michelle Cheek and I'm an engineering supervisor with the Portland Water Bureau and I'm here today with Lester to talk about the corrosion control improvements project. The city's very source of drinking water is the Bull Run watershed. Our current water treatment includes both disinfection and corrosion control treatment. The current corrosion control treatment has been in place since 1997. We currently adjust the pH of our water to approximately 8.2 using sodium hydroxide. This pH adjustment makes the water less corrosive, which reduces the amount of lead from household plumbing that dissolves into drinking water. The Corrosion Control Improvements Project is part of the Water Bureau's ongoing efforts to minimize the corrosion of lead in home and building plumbing. The project will further reduce lead in drinking water through improvements to our corrosion control treatment process. These improvements will be in place by April of 2022. The project is being designed and constructed to meet the requirements of the Environmental Protection Agency's lead and copper rule, which regulates how drinking water systems manage lead and copper in drinking water. The Water Bureau and the Oregon Health Authority have agreed to a compliance timeline to complete this project by April of 2022. Our improved corrosion control treatment will adjust the chemistry of the water to use by using sodium carbonate and carbon dioxide to increase the pH of the water to 8.5 and increase the alkalinity of the water. The alkalinity of the water will, or the increased alkalinity of the water will improve the stability of the pH, which increases the effectiveness of the treatment. This project will be constructed at the Water Bureau's existing Lusted Hill facility where corrosion control treatment occurs today. The project will primarily be located on existing Water Bureau property with the exception of new under chemical feed piping, which will extend into new and existing easements to connect to our existing water conduits. And this is an aerial photograph here of our existing um, Lusted Hill facility. The new facilities will be located directly adjacent to our existing facilities at Lusted Hill. The new facilities will include a new building to house the new OSHA treatment system, a new utility water pump station, and associated piping and support systems. The project will require specialized skill and expertise in the construction of dry, liquid, and gas chemical feed systems for water treatment facilities. 
And um, at the bottom right of the slide there, that is um, a screenshot from the 3D model of the, the design documents showing new facilities adjacent to the existing facilities. The project is under a compliance deadline from the Oregon Health Authority and the completion of the project is required by April of 2022. We recently completed the 90% design of the project and will begin construction later this summer following execution of a construction contract. We're on schedule to meet our compliance deadline. And with that, I will turn it over to Lester for um, a few slides. Thanks, Thank Michelle. For the record, I'm Lester Spittler, the city's chief procurement officer. As you see here, council authorized ordinance number 188621 in September 2017 to exempt this project from the competitive low bid process. In doing so, it allowed us to uh, solicit a request for a proposal for a construction manager slash general contractor or CMGC delivery method. The CMGC procurement method is a two-step process. It begins with a pre-construction services contract where we hire the construction contractor while the project is still being designed so that the contractor can contribute to the design process along with the owner, uh, Water Bureau, as well as the, the design team and the engineers. The pre-construction services also allows early involvement with the construction team and provides the following benefits, concurrent acquisition, design, and construction functions, ability to acquire materials and order fabrication incrementally, reduction of risk of construction delays and unanticipated costs, and evaluation of total project costs based on the design because of the collaborative effort. Next slide. We issued a RFP on, in December of 2018 we received three proposals in January of 2019. They were reviewed, evaluated, and scored by a five-member committee consisting of representatives from the Water Bureau and one member of the Minority Evaluator Program. The committee selected MWH as the highest scoring proposal. As a result of that, the Water Bureau entered into the pre-construction services contract with MWH for a not-to-exceed amount of $332,500. Next slide, please. This is the second, um, oh, Michelle, sorry, you're gonna do this one, right? Yes, correct. Sorry. Um, that's okay. So um, as I mentioned earlier, in addition to reducing levels of lead at customers' taps, the project will benefit the local contracting community through the solicitation of subcontract and equipment procurement packages. These packages will be solicited through local advertisement and outreach to the local contracting community. MWH Constructors has committed to utilizing 25.91% um, of their hard construction costs for disadvantaged minority-owned, women-owned, and emerging small business firms. And Lester will talk about that in a little more detail in the next couple of slides. So this is the second city project that the city's Community Equity and Inclusion Plan applied to. Uh, along with the Community Equity Inclusion Plan, or CEIP, we have a Community Equity and Inclusion Committee that acts as the oversight committee over these projects. Currently, the committee is overseeing three projects. This is one of them. The purpose of the CEIP is to improve and increase construction contracting and employment opportunities for racial and ethnic minorities, women, and economically disadvantaged individuals on city projects to ensure that the city is making conscious and specific efforts through its contracting process to not discriminate and in, or indirectly perpetuate the historic under-inclusion of racial and ethnic minorities, women, and economically disadvantaged individuals in the construction industry and trades, and to ensure that the city receives the benefit of a highly skilled and well-trained workforce and provides opportunities for firms that reflect the diversity of Portland in the contractor and subcontractor pools. Next slide, please. So the CEIP has higher goals than projects that do not apply, do not have the CEIP apply to. So typically our aspirational goal is 20%, but in the CEIP, we ask for 22%, and we prioritize that being 12% for disadvantaged and minority-owned firms, 5% for women-owned firms, and the remaining 5% can be 
um, any number of the certified certifications. The workforce goals are higher as well. There's 31% of total apprenticeable labor hours by, by trade that need to be performed by minorities, 22% and 9% for women. And the same at the journey level. We have 28%, which is a higher goal than um, lower dollar projects, and that's split between 22% minorities and 6% for women. So at this point in the process, MWH has come up with a plan in response to the CEIP. They have attended several CEIC meetings. They've presented to the committee. They've taken feedback and incorporated that committee, and they, they presented at a meeting yesterday. And we have a, have a member from the CEIC here to, um, to provide testimony, Connie Ashbrook. There's also the contractor and Andre Ba on the contractor's team here to present a little bit more on their plan. Um, but we'll finish the, the presentation and then hand it off to them. If Excuse me, Mayor. Before, yeah, but before Lester, you move on, Commissioner Hardesty has her hand up. Sure. sure. And um, thank you, Lester. I appreciated the opportunity to talk about this briefly yesterday. So as I look through this community equity and inclusion plan commitment, um, what I am trying to measure is what you have said to this council in the past is that the reason why we continue to fail in reaching our goals around minority contracting has been because we are forced into the low bid process. Um, and, uh, and so that's been the, the, uh, the message that we've received. So my question is, um, in this particular proposal, we have hired two outside consulting firms um, to identify minority contractors. Don't we already know who all the minority and women and emerging small business contractors are? And to me, that seems to be adding costs that should be unnecessary if we have actually created the relationships that we should have. Yeah, I, I, I can answer that. Um, so the, the contractor in their proposal in response to the RFP, they put together a team and each, and in the RFP, we ask for certain responsibilities to be covered on the contractor team. So in addition to, you know, project superintendent, the, the project principal, uh, the project manager, we also ask for a diversity and equ equity and inclusion uh, person that's going to be on their team that's going to work with their the subcontractors and the prime contractor and conduct the outreach because the city is the city is happy to do it but it's we want to see collective accountability on behalf of the contractor as well and if they're going to you know have this large contract with the city then they need to embody the same values as the city so we well, look the city's paying for it it's not that the contractor's paying for this service the city is well, I'll just say that typically in a design build or a CMGC, there's usually there's members on the contractor team that from that work for the contractor and the city, in this case, helps them by facilitating meetings with the committee and troubleshooting and connecting them with certain organizations or individuals for certain scopes of work or, or, um, or needs on the workforce side so that they can find minorities and women and find minority owned firms for that for that work. Um, and is it because the primary contractor is an out-of-state contractor and doesn't have those relationships? Um, as opposed to a local contractor, yeah. But I think they've they've hired they've hired Andre Ba, who you know has has the relationships and has the local knowledge. So, from a team perspective, even though they're an out-of-state contractor, they, they've hired someone that we we all know and trust will 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 help them. I think you are not understanding my question, so I'll, maybe I'll rephrase it a different way. Um, if this was the exact same contractor and the primary contractor was a local contractor who had worked with the city of Portland in the past, would we expect the same additional costs hiring consultants to actually do outreach to minority women and emerging small business members? Yes, in other proposals where local contractors have responded, um, they have also had members on their team that had this focus for them. Hmm. Thank you. Any further questions? 
I'll entertain a motion. Oh, we're not finished with our presentation yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. That's okay. So, Michelle, I think you're going to take the next slide. Yeah. Yes, sir. So we're here today to recommend the award of a CMGC contract to MWH constructors for the construction of the corrosion control improvements projects for a GMP of $17,989,689 or $989,637. This requ requested contract value includes MWH constructors GMP to complete the work shown in the 90% design documents, an additional $850,000 owner allowance to cover construction of chemical feed piping, which was not fully defined at the 90% design milestone. Carrying this work as an allowance minimizes the inclusion of an excessive contingency in their GMP and an additional a million dollars to for owner control contingency to cover any unknown or unanticipated work that may come up during construction. As the prime contractor, MWH constructors is required to manage the project, self-perform all procurement and self-perform installation and startup of the soda, ash and carbon dioxide systems. The specialty work is approximately 4.7 million of the hard construction cost and is excluded from the requirements of the community equity and inclusion plan. MWH Constructors has submitted a subcontracting plan in accordance with the CEIP, which details how their bid packaging plan will be structured to distribute the remaining 9.5 million of hard construction costs to achieve the goals and requirements of the CEIP. As part of their pre-construction services contract, MWH Constructors has advertised four early procurement packages for the carbon dioxide storage and feed equipment, the soda ash storage and feed systems, the pre-engineered steel building and tree removal. The steel building package was competitively bid with COBID firms, that's the Certification Office for Business and of Inclusion and Diversity, um, firms specifically invited to participate and the tree removal package was provided exclusively to COVID firms for competitive bidding with three firms attending the pre-bid site visit and two firms submitting bids. The remaining subcontracts will not be advertised until the construction contract is executed and will follow MWH Constructor's subcontract, subcontracting plan, which is described in more detail in the next couple of slides and was also included in Exhibit B to the report to council. We have Michael Harmon, Ben McGathy, and Andre Baugh from MWH Constructors here today to help answer any questions on their subcontracting plan. As mentioned earlier, MWH Constructors active to exceed the goals of the CEIP by committing approximately 26% of the hard construction costs to the MWESB firms. Their subcontracting plan identifies multiple tools to maximize subcontract opportunities to COVID firms and engage with workforce providers to maximize opportunities for minorities and women. Three procurement approaches will be utilized, each of which has specific participation requirements. Their informal action process is for packages less than $150,000 and are only sent to COVID firms. A minimum of three COVID firms are targeted for each package. The best value selection process is for packages greater than $150,000. Selection is determined based on a number of criteria, including price, qualifications, and COVID participation. Bids that fail to demonstrate compliance with COVID participation goals are considered non-responsive and rigid. Their price selection is also for packages greater than $150,000. Here, the selection is made by lowest responsive bid but must also demonstrate compliance with COVID participation goals. Again, bids that fail to demonstrate compliance with these goals are considered non-responsive and rejected. These procurement approaches highlight that COVID participation is a priority for this project. And I won't cover this table in detail, but it lists all of the subcontract work packages, um, the planned a pre procurement approach for each and the COVID participation goals for each, which adds up to the target 
25.91% of the hard construction costs. And um, this is the end of our presentation, but as Lester mentioned, we've got um, a member from the Community Equity and Inclusion Committee here to um, provide some testimony. And we also have MWH constructors available to answer, help answer any questions you may have. Let's go ahead and move to Connie, um, if that's okay. Lester? Yes, Connie. Hi. How are you? Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Connie Ashbrook. I'm Principal of Ashbrook Consulting, as well as Co-Chair of the National Task Force on Trade Women's Issues. I'm a member of the Community Equity and Inclusion Committee, the CEIC, that is monitoring projects that have a community equity and inclusion plan component. Many of you know me from my pre-retirement years when I founded and ran Oregon Tradeswomen for 21 years. Mayor, you gave a wonderful speech at one of our pre-apprenticeship graduations. Thank you for that. I'm here to support execution of the construction contract with MWH and moving forward with this project. MWH has been very responsive to not just the letter, but the spirit of the CEIP the city's approach to eliminating disparity in its public works and thus alleviating poverty in its residents. MWH has been meeting regularly with the CEIC and has welcomed our suggestions for strengthening their approach to diversity and equity in contracting and workforce. For instance, early on, we provided detailed criticism and suggestions for um, suggestions for their initial community equity and inclusion plan. And they immediately went back to the drawing board and came back with a stronger and more responsive plan. I also want to praise their recently um, discussed best value scoring matrix that they talked to us about at the committee meeting yesterday that includes awarding points for equity factors. Of course, most of their plan has not yet put into action at this phase, but I have every confidence that they will achieve the goals of the CEIP. I hope you will vote to execute this construction contract with MWH. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate your testimony. Good to see you again. Thanks, Connie. Commissioner Hardesty has a question. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Connie. Uh, what a pleasure to see you again. I knew you wouldn't be retired long. Um, <laughs> you say you are on a CEIP. Um, and how long has that committee been convened? I think it's been about a year now. Maybe not quite a year. Let's and, probably have the details. All right. And, um, and um, is this a committee that will monitor the day-to-day -day activities of these contracts or are you just, what? What is the role of the CEIP committee as it relates to the equity goals that the city has laid out for this contract? Yes, so we are meeting monthly and we get reports from uh, the the city's workforce training and hiring program and procurement department on both the uh, contractor diversity and workforce diversity. And so I'm, I'm, are you getting real time information or when you get your information at your meeting, how old is that information and can you act on it immediately? Uh, we can act on it immediately to the best of our ability and um, I don't, I think the information we get is about a month old. I think it depends on the cycle of reporting versus uh, the committee meeting times. Well, that's my, that's, I guess that's kind of my concern. I'm just wondering if you have information in a timely enough manner to change the direction of the work that the contractor is about to start doing or if you're a committee that's just reviewing things after the fact? I do believe we get information early enough to, to uh, provide strong feedback and guidance. Um, we're, 
one of the discussions we had yesterday at the committee was what are what is our ability to uh, to ask for penalties for a contractor that's not following through. Right. And so we really need to go back and outline that and make it really clear and um, see what the formal authority is to to provide those penalties and meaningful penalties. We are monitoring two, three projects right now, Capitol Highway, uh, Sullivan's Gulch and corrosion control and only Sullivan's Gulch is in the construction phase. Uh -huh. Uh, thank you, Connie. That's been really helpful. Um, I share the same concerns that the committee has because if you're not receiving timely information, it cannot be changed in a timely manner. Um, so I appreciate um, uh, hopefully getting a report from the committee uh, sometime uh, about those three projects and kind of whether or not this process has added value. Uh, I greatly appreciate the volunteer work that you and other committee members are doing. Um, but as you know, Connie, we have not uh, we have not found the magic combination to actually achieve the goals that the city continues to set. And so, again, thanks for coming out of retirement and and doing a, a few of these things for us. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Does that complete the presentation, Lester? It does. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. All right. Very good. Is there any further discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Daly, a second from Commissioner Fritz. Any further discussion? Carla, please. Yeah, call. Mayor, I was, right, I was please. just wondering if, I, I was wondering if Andre Ball wanted to say anything. Um, good morning, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Fritz. Um, I would just, um, to the comments of Comm uh, Commissioner Harstein, um, say uh, one of the best practices in my 25 years of doing this work is having, um, if you will, a watchdog that um, the CEIC can do and talk to contractors. I've been on the other side um, and had those committees, uh, they become very effective in delivering your goals, the city values. So um, I, I will tell you, um, so far they've been very effective with this contractor and I think the other contractors and um, I, the people that are on that committee um, have given the authority, can change um, the trajectory of a project that seems off track if they get the information as you've indicated um, early enough and and I think the city's committed to providing that information to the committee is my understanding so um, with that um, if we or any other contractor they're monitoring is off track I think you will see um, corrective action um, put, um, put for the contractor and uh, but I I don't think at least for this project and um, for MWH, we're not gonna be off track. Uh, we are gonna deliver on your values um, that the city has set forth and um, not only meet them, but to beat them. And, and we're gonna do it with, you know, the underutilized, historically underutilized um, people and uh, focus on that. Very good, thank you. Andre, we appreciate it. Thank you for your service. Any Thank further you. questions or discussions on this item, colleagues? Carla, please call the roll. Artisty. Um, I am grateful that there is a community oversight board that will be monitoring this. I, I have to say I'm really nervous when we uh, create a process whereby uh, we promise a lot of goodies and at the end of the day, <laughs> Traditionally, we don't bless you, <laughs> whoever that was. Uh, um, however, um, uh, we promise that we're going to live up to our values uh, system um, and um, uh, and rarely achieve it. When we're talking about such significant uh, public dollars uh, as this contract represents, um, I certainly have an expectation that we would exceed any minimum 
uh, requirements. Uh, this city council recently passed a resolution really prioritizing BIPOC community members. And those have been the communities that have been least uh, prioritized as it relates to contracting with the city of Portland. Um, I do not expect one committee to solve all the problems that the city of Portland has and are achieving our goals around contracting. Um, but I will be looking to this committee to provide some real life, real time information that helps the city as the city receives both the audit that will tell us about how much we fail in achieving our goals and then the direction that we give to pro uh, uh, procurement um, to make sure that we live up to the resolutions that we pass here at the city council. Um, I look forward to attending one or two of these meetings to actually see in real life what, what happens in this group. Um, I know Connie's not a pushover, so any committee that Connie's on has got to be a committee that's very thoughtful. Um, and so I am reluctantly voting aye, uh, but as Lester already knows that I am a thorn in his side because I want us to not just achieve minimum goals, but I want us to ex um, to have extraordinary growth in how we identify contract with and work with uh, minority and women owned contractors. And um, in the last 18 months, I have not been that impressed. I am hoping that this process will uh, provide us some um, some opportunities to really rethink who has access to public dollars. That's my that's my bottom line. I'm following the dollars everywhere, and what I've seen so far, I'm woefully uh, disappointed. Uh, so I'll keep my eye out. I will vote yes, and we will see uh, in real time whether or not we are achieving what we all say our value system requires us to. I vote aye. You daily. Aye. Fritz. Well, this project is significant for multiple reasons. Um, first, it does achieve the compliance schedule that we, uh, the Water Bureau, is required to have regarding uh, treating the water to a pH where the lead that may be in people's homes is less likely to leach in. And so it's important for public health. Um, and Everybody should continue to know that just run your tap for two minutes before, at the beginning of the day until it's cold, and then you will have delicious, safe drinking water. So thank you to Michelle Cheek and the, the team at Portland, Portland Water Bureau and Lester Spitler for the um, for the presentation. Thank you, Connie Ashbrook and Andre Barr, who have been involved in this conversation for the 11 and a half years that I've been on the council. And this actually does represent um, significant improvements in what was happening 12 years ago. And uh, it, as, as Connie mentioned, it is one of the first three projects that are going through the community equity and inclusion process plan with the, with the uh, commission being uh, doing the oversight. And the reason it's a, it's a construction management general contractor, and that's how we get to higher than the minimum. And I know that Andre will, will work with the consultant to make sure that, that when the project comes back to council, long after I'm gone, it's finally complete, I've just gone from the council, hopefully not gone from the planet, um, that um, Commissioner Hardesty will be happy with the um, with the results uh, that, that you're going to be able to achieve with this process. So, you know, this is, this is our best thinking on the way forward for achieving better contracting numbers and the outcomes that we all have been striving for. And I really appreciate that. Finally, I would normally thank all of the folks in the Water Bureau who have done the engineering and consulting on this. And um, so I do thank you. I also honor Mike Stewart, who the director of the Water Bureau, who has um, served the Bureau well for 17 years and is going to be retiring uh, shortly. So I thank you, Mike, because he has definitely um, focused on resilience and safety and getting these infrastructure projects done that will make our water supply safe and secure and abundant for generations to come. Um, very happy to vote aye. And thank you, colleagues, for your for your uh, support. Aye. Wheeler. All right. The report, the ordinance is, excuse me, the report is accepted. 
Uh, colleagues, we still have 13 items based on the time frame of what's been provided by bureaus. Uh, they are proposing the remaining items would take about two additional hours. Um, I remind you that we have a long afternoon agenda starting at two. Um, so I would ask us to be expeditious in our uh, process as we move forward. I'm going to try and speed this up a little bit if you don't mind. Uh, so Carla, could you read items 537 and 539 together? They are actually related, 537 and 539. Mm -hmm. 537 authorized revenue bonds to refund outstanding bonds and revenue bonds in an amount sufficient to provide not more than $4.3 million to finance improvements to the Headwaters Apartments project. And 539 amend the fiscal year 2020 21 budget and authorize amending the intergovernmental agreement with home forward and payment of up to $5,175,233 and appropriation of million dollars for capital repairs to the Headwaters Apartments. Colleagues, the Portland Housing Bureau came into, home, came into ownership of several projects from the Portland Development Commission as a result of the creation of the Bureau back in 2010. Home Ford is performing services as the asset manager for these properties covered under an existing intergovernmental agreement. One of those services includes development services such as con contracting on behalf of the city for repairs. During a capital needs assessment in the fall of 2019, it was determined that one of the properties, the Headwaters Apartments, required a roof replacement due to defects. The following ordinances will, one, allow the city to move forward with the coordinating and financing of these capital improvements and related costs, and the second will allow the refinancing of existing bonds previously issued for the project. With details, our PHB Director Shannon Callahan and Debt Manager Matt Gerard. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. I do have a brief PowerPoint if we could pull that up and yeah. I'll try to go, I'll try to go through very, very quickly if I can. Um, Carla, can you pull up the PowerPoint that's associated with item 539, please? So much to be getting that just a second here, Shannon. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, as the mayor mentioned, the Headwaters Apartments uh, was constructed by um, PDC in 2006. Um, late last year in um, approximately August, we noticed during a capital needs assessment, some uh, roof defects that um, upon further investigation, we realized that the building um, uh, was having a catastrophic roof failure. Um, at that point, um, we moved very swiftly to relocate tenants on the fourth floor of the building um, over the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. And our partners at BDS um, actually yellow tagged the fourth floor, meaning that it is unsafe for occupancy. Um, in the meantime, next slide, please. Um, in the meantime, can you advance one more time? Uh, in the meantime, we've made safety um, and immediate repairs to the building, and we are now prepared to use what we hope are um, rain-free summer months to actually remove the roof and do the re um, repair and replacement. Next slide, please. This gives you an idea of some of the damage um, that we encountered in the building um, and uh, completely unexpected, especially for a building of this age. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, this is a breakdown of what we expect the project budget to be. Um, that said, we are asking for an additional um, 25%. Um, in case there are things that um, we do not expect as this roof replacement has been very unexpected and we have encountered a variety of different issues with the roof um, and the, the structure of the roof throughout this process. Next slide. So um, we plan to modify our agreement with uh, um, Home Forward to allow them to complete the needed repairs so that we can take advantage of the summer months and also move the tenants back in the building that have been re, um, relocated. We'll be using some portion of project reserves for the repairs. And then um, Matt Garak is here to talk about the refinancing proposition um, that we expect um, to be able to um, get the rest of the funding needed for the repairs. Thank you. Um, if you, you can take the slide down and Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Shannon. 
Thanks, Shannon. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. The ordinance under item 537 authorizes the city to issue bonds for financing $4 million of capital improvements for the headwaters apartments, plus additional amounts for financing costs. In addition to the $4 million borrowing, the ordinance also provides authorization to refinance the city's existing series 2005A limited tax revenue bonds related to the headwaters apartments currently outstanding in the amount of 7.2 million. The 2005A bonds require above market interest payments and will be refinanced for savings. Under current projections, total present value savings for the refinancing will be approximately $970,000. Similar to the terms of the 2005A bonds, the upcoming borrowing, borrowing will be secured by both the full faith and credit of the city and the net revenues of the Headwaters Apartment Project. However, the project's operations are expected to continue funding all debt service costs. Taking into account the savings of the refinancing and additional debt service related to the capital improvements, projected annual debt service is expected to be roughly the same as current debt service levels under the 2005A bonds. However, the final maturity of the Headwaters bonds will be extended from 2035 to 2040. The city's debt management team expects to place the bonds directly with the bank as a private placement given the, des the desire to maximize future prepayment flexibility. We anticipate the financing will close mid-August of 2020. Uh, we're asking this to be authorized today as an emergency ordinance in order to fund the capital repairs as early as possible this summer. And with that, I can answer any questions on the financing. Thanks, Matt. Colleagues, any questions at this point? Does that conclude your presentations for both 537 and 539? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor, if you, um, we're here to answer any questions or go deeper into the ordinance if needed. All right, Commissioner Fritz, then we'll move to public testimony. I just wanted to ask, you know, this is a relatively new building. Is there no liability on behalf of the developer? Um, Commissioner, there is a 10-year statute of limitations in the state of Oregon um, if we were to pursue a construction defect. Um, and so we are outside of that time uh, horizon. We have engaged um, or are engaging an insurance consultant to assist us with possibly filing um, insurance claims. Um, thus far, we have not been successful, um, but we do not have a recourse at this point against the developer, no. Thank you. Very good colleagues, any further questions for Matt or Shannon? Seeing none, Carla, do we have any public testimony on item 537 or 539? No one registered for either of those. All right, very good. With that then, Carla, please call the roll on 537. Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Shannon and Matt, for that uh, uh, very succinct but detailed report. Um, uh, Matt answered my question about the emergency, and Shannon asked, answered my question. Uh, Actually, Commissioner Fritz asked my question about why aren't we making a developer uh, uh, fix this problem? Um, and so I hate when I don't have any questions that come out of uh, things that are emergencies. So I vote aye. You, Daly? Well, if this is the quality we can expect from new construction, it doesn't bode well for the theory that today's uh, market rate housing will be tomorrow's affordable housing. Uh, this is just a terrible situation, and um, I appreciate everyone's efforts. I vote aye. Thanks. I'm sorry, I didn't hear if I was called, but I'll just oh, go. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, thank you, Director Callahan. Obviously, this is a, a, a bad situation which you're making the best of, and the, the main thing is that you're looking after the tenants and getting the building fixed. So thank you for doing that, and thank you for the debt management staff for doing it as um, least expensively as possible. Aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. Thank you. The ordinance is adopted. 539, please call the roll. Hardesty. Aye. You daily? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? 
All right, the ordinance is adopted. Thank you both for your presentations. Carla, let's go back to 538, please. Grant voluntary recognition as provided under ORS 243.6663 to the Professional and Technical Employees Union, Local 17, to represent the collective bargaining interest of city employees in the classification of Engineer 2, job class number 3003046. Colleagues, this is an important ordinance and I'm, I'm pleased to bring it forward. The purpose of this ordinance is to grant recognition to the Engineer 2 classification in a represented status under the PROTEC 17 and to modify the terms in the collective bargaining agreement to the letter of agreement. The classification of Engineer 2 was adopted by the City Council back in December of 2018 and revised again in 2019. There are currently four incumbent employees in that classification. The incumbent employees have signed, quote, showing of interest, unquote, cards, indicating their interest in having Protect 17 as their collective bargaining representative. No other labor organization has demonstrated to the city a showing of interest from the incumbent employees in the classification of Engineer 2. The incumbent employees have shown no interest in being represented by any other labor organization other than Protect 17. Joining us today is Chief Human Resource Officer, Kathy Bless. Good morning, Kathy, how are you today? Oh, it's Anne, Anne Marie, but you're uh, muted, Anne Marie. Welcome. Can you unmute? Anne Marie, can you unmute? You're muted. I can't, we can't hear you. Let's try that again. Sorry about that, guys. No worries. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Anne Marie Kevorkian Maddie. I am with uh, Bureau, of, Bureau of Human Resources with the Labor Relations Team, and I'll be sitting in for Kathy Bless this morning. Um, first and foremost, I uh, wanted to uh, just uh, say that the ordinance before you provides recognition, as the mayor described, to the Engineer 2 classification under uh, the ProTech Union. And I'd like to acknowledge that um, it's critically important to the city, uh, VHR, and labor relations to create collaborative relationships with our union partners. Uh, and so by um, approving this ordinance, uh, voluntarily recognizing this group of employees into the ProTech bargaining unit would be representative of this collaboration. Um, I don't have any additional uh, information I think that is necessary for this ordinance, but if you have questions, I'm available to answer. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Colleagues, any questions at this point? Carla, is there any public testimony on this item? No one registered. All right, we're making good progress here. Please call the roll. Hardesty. Aye. You daily? Um, I just wanna acknowledge the city's voluntary recognition um, of these employees. And I'm proud to be part of a pro-union uh, city council and I vote aye. Fritz. Appreciate the work done by Human Resources and the employees involved, as well as Protect 17, uh, for the great work that they do. Aye. Wheeler. Yep, good work all around. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you, and Anne Marie, thank you for filling in. We appreciate it. Carla, next item 540. Authorized 17 subrecipient contracts totaling $5,062,200 for services in support of providing affordable housing to include emergency home repair, home ownership counseling and education, and renter services, including relocation assistance and education and advocacy. Colleagues, Portland Housing Bureau's subrecipient contracts leverage city funding sources to help some of Portland's most effective nonprofit organizations provide the housing services our community needs the most. The services are provided to Portland's low to moderate income residents. Obviously, at this time, those services, if anything, are oversubscribed. A robust and intensive public planning process informed the priorities for CDBG funding, objectives, and strategies of the services provided in these subrecipient agreements. 
With us today to give a few more details about this ordinance are uh, Housing Program Coordinator uh, Emma Deppa, and I also see Shannon Callahan is standing by as well. Or Shannon, are you are you doing the presentation on this? Actually, Mayor, I'm just here to support my team members, um, our two managers of the Neighborhood Housing Program teams, Ms. Dana Shepard and the Rental Services Office, Kim McCarty, are on the call just to briefly go through um, the contracts that we're going to be entering into as well as the reporting requirements for our service providers. With that, Great. I'll turn it over to Dana. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Dana and Kim. And I'm sorry, my, my comment sheet did not have either of you listed. I apologize for that oversight. No problem at all, Mayor. So good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Again, my name is Dana Shepard, and I am the Neighborhood Housing Preservation Teams Manager at the Housing Bureau. So the master ordinance includes the PHB subrecipient contracts that exceed 100,000, so it does not include all subrecipient contracts. So I will speak to the nine of the 17 contracts listed in the master ordinance, which are managed by the Neighborhood Housing Preservation Team, also known as NHP Team. And Kim McCarthy can speak to the others. So the NHP contracts provide the following services. We have the homeowner access program, and that's the home buyer education and counseling. So we have a host of PHB uh, partners in their culturally specific organization. You heard from one of them today, actually, um, Kimberly Horner, and um, other partners. They support Portland residents with one-on-one -on -one counseling and also group financial counseling, again, culturally specific counseling. And then we have the foreclosure prevention and home repair grant program. And those both, the both of those are a part of the city's home retention strategy. So homeowners receive small grants to address the critical needs, health and safety issues, such as weatherization materials, accessibility features, wheelchair ramps, and then also they address BDS violations to avoid fines. So just to let you know about how the contracts work, we have assigned contract managers along with PHP data and finance teams who work collaboratively in determining outputs and measurable outcomes. Um, they collect and track and get regular reporting from the subrecipient contractors. And that includes data and narrative reports. Um, and then also along with that, we have on-site, regular on-site program and fiscal monitoring of the subrecipients. And I will go ahead and pass it along to Kim McCarthy to speak about the others. Thank, Thank you, Dana. Um, good morning, Commissioners, Mayor, and Kim McCarty with the Rental Services Office. And as Dana outlined, um, we have a robust um, process for monitoring our subrecipients and communicating with them to develop the scope of services. Um, the focus with all of the rental service office subrecipients is to address impediments to fair housing. And we do that by focusing on our culturally specific partners and their clients, um, which are pr primarily our black, indigenous, Latinx, and other communities of color, um, and also um, individuals with in disabilities. So specifically, um, as Dana outlined, for this particular master ordinance, this is just the sub we have a number of subrecipients, but we're focused just on the ones with over $100,000. So I'll go through those um, in order. Um, our largest subrecipient is the Community Alliance of Tenants, and they do they have a number of programs that are addressed to um, address the needs of renters. Um, first is their education and outreach and their helpline. Um, they answer calls from um, thousands of residents, um, most of them from Portland and Multnomah County. Um, they also do one-on-one -on -one assistance um, with a tenant advocacy. So many renters need help with writing a letter or calling their landlord or seeking um, an attorney and they help them with navigating that process and getting that kind of assistance. Um, Community Alliance of Tenants also has um, a number of partners, um, Metropolitan Public Defenders, APANO, ERCO, um, and SCI, um, to name a few. And that's a really important part of, of this work that they're doing, that they do it in a, in a collaborative um, environment and they act as a pass-through agency for resources to those partners. 
Um, next is the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. We contract with them to help renters primarily um, in the city of Portland understand their fair housing rights. Um, often this type of advocacy takes can take years. You can imagine someone who's experienced discrimination and um, access to a rental unit, or they have maybe experienced um, harassment or failure by the landlord to um, offer some kind of uh, accommodation. Um, that kind of work um, takes a lot of understanding of fair housing law. It can take years to go through the court system. And um, so while they answer hundreds of calls every year, um, they specifically do about 50 investigations that are fair housing related. And then they also do fair housing testing to give us a sense of where the, the types of fair housing violations are taking place so that we can better um, focus our resources on those types of impediments that people are experiencing in the rental market. Um, our other partner is Impact Northwest. Um, That's a social service organization, um, but they specifically work with us with renters that are experiencing types of, of scenarios in their housing where they are, um, are experiencing an environmental health problem. So this could be mold, lead, um, types of issues that the landlord should be addressing, but they're not addressing, and they, yeah. those residents need help with, with moving to a safer location. And we, um, they help us with about 50 households a year. Legal Aid Services of Oregon um, helps us both with fair housing cases and with landlord tenant disputes. Um, probably about 50 cases are related to fair housing and over 150 are landlord tenant types of cases where they're going with a renter to court to address security deposit issues, eviction notices, um, and those kinds of things that help people stabilize people and keep them in their homes. Excuse me, Kim. Yes, sorry. Can I break in and ask the yeah. question? I've been trying to break in, but you've been on the roll. So <laughs> um, you were, I, I want to go back to your description of the Community Alliance of Tenants. And uh, you said something about they partner with other cultural specific organizations and they are the pass through uh, of resources to some of these other organizations. Some of the ones you mentioned are a lot bigger than uh, the Community Alliance of Tenants. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how that relationship works when um, mega organizations are receiving pass-through dollars from a small community-based effort. Uh, what's the logic in that? You're on mute. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that um, question, Commissioner. You're welcome. So, um, ERCO, uh, yes, of course, is a very large organization, um, but I'll just explain um, the, the reasoning here. Community Alliance of Tenants um, is working with APANO, SEI, and ERCO, and also uh, Metropolitan Public Defenders to um, in, embed some of their workers in those organizations. So over time, they realized that they weren't reaching people where, where people were um, naturally going. So right. people are seeking services at ERCO as an example, or they might be coming to APANO because that's a place that they're very comfortable. Um, but the, the staff at ERCO or at APANO may not have the in-depth knowledge of landlord-tenant law to um, address the needs of the people that are coming to them. And some of that information was getting lost when they would say, well, just call Community Alliance of Tenants and they'll take care of you. Maybe that person doesn't follow up on that phone call. Um, maybe they needed that help right then and there while they were in the office at Apano. Um, so they, so Community Alliance of Tenants is taking, with their partners, um, is taking a different approach and having staff part-time at those locations to specifically address the needs of those clients that are looking for landlord tenant type of advice. Very good, thank you. Right, thank you so much, Kim, appreciate that. That's very helpful. Um, so the last um, sub-recipient that I wanted to talk about is Urban League. 
Um, Urban League of Portland um, has a very innovative program um, that they've been working on for the last couple of years in partnership with the Legal Aid Services of Oregon and Fair Housing Council of Oregon. There, um, it's also a partner, um, and the, the main partner um, in terms of, of clients is El Programa. So there's been a, um, a recognition that our Black and Latinx community members are more at risk of experiencing fair housing discrimination. Um, but many, but we also can know um, from our partnership with Fair Housing Council of Oregon that many of our community members from the Black and Latinx community are not calling. They're not seeking the help. They may not be getting the help that they need. So with Urban League and El Programa, um, we have their clients coming to an organization that they feel comfortable with. And then they, um, those stories um, and those people are partnered with Fair Housing Council of Oregon and Lasso. And as a result of that partnership, we are finding better outcomes. People are calling, people are sharing their stories, and they are getting the legal services that they need. So that concludes my um, presentation, and I'll take any questions if there are any. Very good. Colleagues, any further questions at this point? Carla, do we have public testimony on this item? No one registered. All right. Very good. Then with that, call the roll. Curtis D. Aye. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Thank you for the presentation and for all your work. That's very helpful to get more explanation about what the services are. Aye. Wheeler? Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Kim. You guys are doing awesome work. Really appreciate it. Makes it easy to support. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 541, please. Establish code sections to administer the FAR transfer from existing affordable housing and three-bedroom unit FAR density bonus option programs that were approved through the Better Housing by Design Zoning Code project. Colleagues, the council approved the Better Housing by Design Zoning Code project back in December of 2019. The project included bonus programs created to increase the development of housing affordable to low and moderate income home buyers and renters across the city. The Portland Housing Bureau is here today with code allowing the bureau to effectively administer both the affordable housing bonus transfer pro program as well as the three bedroom bonus program that were both approved back in December. And so with that, I believe we have Matt Scheibold and Dory Van Bockel here. I see Dory and Matt, are you with us as well today? You have just me today. Matt is out this week on furlough. Well, Dory, you'll do great. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. So just a quick uh, rundown. So code section 30.01150 is in addition to the affordable housing code to establish the floor area ratio transfer from existing affordable housing program for properties with existing housing affordable to households earning up to 60% of median family income to transfer floor area ratio to another site. That's based on zoning code subsection 33.120.210D1A, which went into effect March 1st of this year. And additionally, code section 3001160 is um, addition to the affordable housing code to establish the three bedroom unit FAR density bonus option program to encourage more family sized units by providing a 25% FAR bonus for projects with three bedroom units affordable to households earning up to 100% immediate family income based on zoning code subsection 33120211 3C and this went into effect June 1st of this year. So codification of these programs in Title 30 allows the Housing Bureau to move forward with rulemaking, ensuring effective administration of the programs, which are already available under the current zoning code. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good. Any questions for Dory at this point? Seeing none. Are, Carla, has anybody signed up for public testimony? No one registered. Very good. This is a, an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Hardesty. 
Aye. You, Daly? Aye. Fritz? It's impressive how quickly you've got this done. Thank you. Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you, Dory. Uh, I would like Carla, unless somebody tells me why I can't, I'd like to read items 542, 543, 544, 545, and 546 together. 542, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for Bernie 1, located at 5980 East Burnside Street, 543, approve application under the multi-unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for Bernie 2, located at 5960 East Burnside Street, 544, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for Cesar apart Apartments, located at 1604, Southeast Cesar Chavez Boulevard, 545, approve application under the local unit limited tax exemption program, under the inclusionary housing program for PROV 3 apartments located at 5505 Northeast Gleason Street, and 546, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program, under the inclusionary housing program for Pepsi Blocks Phase 1A, Building A, located at 827 Northeast 27th Avenue. Very good. And colleagues, I am taking item 545 and pulling it back to my office. So 545 is coming back to my office. And Dory, you're up for all of these. Welcome. All right. I am going to uh, share my screen. So give me a moment, please, to get a presentation up for you. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, I can certainly just go ahead without the presentation too, um, real quickly. So I do have- uh, Dory, this is Keelan. I can bring it up if you would like. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I don't know why I was suffering through that. So <laughs> I'll proceed. So, um, so starting in February of 2017, any building adding 20 or more new units is required to contribute to the city's affordable housing inventory through the inclusionary housing program. And developers must choose from several options in order to fulfill inclusionary housing requirements, providing affordable units in an otherwise market rate building, sending units to another building or paying into the inclusionary housing fund. And so the multiple unit limited tax exemption or multi program is one of the financial incentives provided to inclusionary housing buildings, making units affordable rather than paying a fee in lieu. And each multi application, as you know, comes before city council for approval. Um, so, and that's, so if you want to move through the first slide, please, Keelan. And that's what I just described there. And so if we can move on to the next one. So the um, applications before you today, with the exception of Prov 3 apartments, which we did pull back to make a technical change to the ordinance. So um, the other four projects that we are um, hearing today are for the Caesar Apartments on Southeast Caesar Chavez Boulevard, Bernie 1 and Bernie 2 on East Burnside Street, as well as uh, the first phase of the Pepsi Blocks project on 27th and uh, Sandy in Northeast Portland. If you'd like to go to the next slide, please. So first for the Caesar Apartments, um, this project, uh, the developer selected in the residential only apartment building um, to restrict at least 15% of the units is affordable at 80% median family income for 99 years. And that amounts to eight of the total 51 units with restricted affordability. So the building's affordable units are representative of the total units in the building and will be comprised of four studio, three one bedroom and one two bedroom units. Um, 
so out, you know, outside of the central city plan district under the inclusionary housing program, it means that a project is eligible for a tax exemption on only the units with the restricted, restricted affordability. So in this case, eight, those eight units and an associated percentage of residential common areas will receive the exemption and the other 43 market rate units in the land will be fully taxed. Um, and so as you can see with that, can we move to the next slide? Excuse me, before you move, Mayor, I have a question. Yes, yeah. Yes, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Corey. Um, my question is, what is the square footage of the market rate un units? Are the studios one bedrooms and two bedrooms the exact same average as it is for the affordable units? Yes, yeah, so per the uh, inclusionary housing program guidelines, the affordable units need to be at least 90% of the average square footage of all the units of that type in the building. So these averages are inclusive, inclusive of both the uh, market and affordable rate units. And do you know what the square footage is for SROs? Um, I don't know that there's a particular cutoff for an, an SR specifically within building code. Um, because at what we're calling a studio, I would call an SRO. Um, so I'm just curious as, as to whether or not these are really units that people can afford to live in when they're that tiny. And the fact that we're calling them studios in one bedrooms and what looks like very, very tiny units. Um, I guess I'm concerned, but if and all the market rates are supposed to be 90% of the same square footage? The affordable units need to be at least 90% of the average of the of that unit type. So the average square footage of all the units in the building for the studios are at that 285 and the average of all the one bedrooms is 396 and so on. So within, um, when, when uh, units or developments are reviewed by planning and zoning through the Bureau of Development Services, they only deem dwelling units to be those that have a full kitchen and bathroom, as well as, um, uh, and then any bedrooms, we also um, determine to have full um, egress access and um, to have windows. And so uh, an SRO in that case would be different in that it wouldn't be subject to even the inclusionary housing because it's not considered a dwelling unit. So there is a difference in that case and it's not deemed strictly on size. Thank you. You're welcome. So as far as looking at the tax benefit, um, since again, this is only restricting the affordable units in the building um, over the total 10 years, there's roughly $85,000 in taxes that will be exempt. And per unit over the 99 years of affordability, that's a little over $100. And so next slide. If we compare that then to the average rent discount between the market rents and then the studio rents, um, there's about a $188 difference um, per month for that. I mean, obviously those things change over time, both on the affordable and the market, but that's the best we can do to kind of make an average of what that monthly savings is compared to the value of the tax exemption. Want to go to the next slide? Sorry, Mayor, can we go back to the last one again for just a sec, please? Sure, Hersky. So there's only a hundred dollars difference between or less than that between an affordable studio and a market rate studio. It's like a ten dollar difference. And and because these are smaller buildings or smaller units, that's probably why there is a lesser difference, right? And even within the market, um, these aren't going to be at an extremely high um, cost for market rents. I, 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 <laughs> that's very interesting. And we're given a a a, a, a ten year tax break for ten bucks, ten bucks off. <laughs> No, it's a, well, $188 compared to what was it, $108 um, on average. 
and you know remember the tax exemption is only for the first 10 yeah. years and right. the affordability is going to last for the 99 years or inclusionary housing and so even if the market gets to be more expensive, these are still going to be limited to um, the affordable rents. To 60 per uh, 80%. This is an 80% MFI? This project is, yes, based on the option that they selected. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and uh, if we can skip through Prov 3, this is the one that we're pulling back. And next we have Bernie one. Let's bring up my notes. So with under the inclusionary housing option for this project, which is also a residential only apartment building, the Bernie one is required to restrict at least again, 15% of the units is affordable at 80% of median family income for the 99 years. So out of the 29 units, there's four with restricted affordability and the building's units or affordable units are representative of the total units in the building. And so that comes out to two studio, one one bedroom and one two bedroom units. And um, again, outside of the Central City Plan District, district um, these four units will be the only ones benefiting from the tax exemption over that time frame, and the rest of the units will be fully taxable. Um, and so if we wanna Scroll through that to the next slide. And again, um, that comes out to an average about $114 per unit over the 99 years compared to, I think we have the same rent difference in the next slide because the market rents are similar then. Um, so it's very similar average rent discount. So these are smaller projects. The market rents on them wouldn't have been a lot higher, but still over what the uh, minimum affordable rates would be for a building of this size. So we'll move on to Bernie 2, which is similar, um, obviously being developed by the same folks. And uh, this one, um, they also chose the same option of 15% at 80% of median family income. And that results in six of 42 units with a strict restricted affordability. And um, based on the unit composition ends up to be three studio, two one bedroom and one three bedroom units. And um, those again are the only units that will have um, the benefit from the exemption in this case. And uh, we can go through to the next slide. And uh, the average on that is 118,000 based on our estimate of what the total taxes and therefore the exemption would be. And next slide, please. And uh, just based on the rents they proposed in this building, it actually ends up being a little bit higher rent difference. So between the affordable rents and the market rents for this particular project. So we can move to the, the final project, which is the Pepsi Blocks phase three, or phase one, excuse me, building A. And this one is a little bit more unique um, in that, um, so with this building, they're required to restrict at least 8% of the units as they've chosen the 60% in median family income option. And again, that's for 99 years. So that amounts to 18 of the total 219 units in the building that will have restricted affordability. For this particular project, the developer opted to reconfigure the building's required number of affordable units by providing an alternative mix based on the total number of bedrooms required by the IH option selected. And so by reconfiguring the total number of bedrooms into the affordable units of two bedrooms or more, uh, this results in a building with a smaller overall number of affordable units, but they're providing affordable family-sized units. And so with that, um, and with the option originally selected, the 8% of the building that was um, selected, they um, would have needed to provide six studio, seven one bedroom and four two bedrooms, as well as one three bedroom unit, which totals 24 bedrooms. So to walk through that reconfiguration option, the, the final result is that there will be two studio, four one bedroom, 
three two bedroom and four three bedroom affordable units. And again, that's over that full 99 year period or at 60% of median family income. So this building is restricting an additional 31 of the total 219 units to include five studio, nine one bedroom, nine two bedroom, and eight three bedroom units to also be affordable at 60% of median family income, making a total of 44 units of the 219. And they're doing this because the building is part of a planned unit development. Um, the developer is planning to fulfill the inclusionary housing requirement for the whole site. So the additional buildings that will be built um, within the plan development by um, consolidating these additional units in this particular building that's getting built first. So the Housing Bureau will be reviewing the subsequent building permit applications on site and confirm that the units provided in this building fulfill each future building's um, responsibilities as those also come in for permit. Um, so only since this is also outside of the central city plan district, the 44 units that are being made affordable over that 99 year time frame will will receive the exemption um, as of the completion of this building, even if the units are being sent from other buildings that are built later on. Um, Dwayne, so can I ask a question about that last comment you made? Um, yeah. So there will be five buildings and we're all in this mixed use environment, right? Um, and you're saying that the developer wants to build all the quote unquote affordable rate units in the first building that will be built? Correct. Um, and you will be monitoring the other buildings for what? So because the program has that 90% um, of the average square footage requirement, for instance, it has a few other requirements about consolidating units into one building. Right. So we'll want to make sure that the units that they've chosen to fulfill, that the mix of studio, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, et cetera, does meet indeed the standards for each of the additional buildings that gets built. And so if they're not able to fulfill that down the road when other when other, uh, one of the other buildings are is built, they'll have to provide units on site in those buildings. Thank you. I, I actually was concerned about this because I was concerned that the uh, uh, affordable, well, the 60% MFI units uh, would be something that would be down the road. So I'm very uh, supportive of those units being built first because uh, we've had that experience in Portland where developers run out of money halfway through a project and oops, what didn't get built was the affordable housing unit. So I, right. I think this is a good model for us to uh, be moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you want to move to the next slide, please. So this is a description then of the per unit and total um, tax exemption over the 10 years. So a larger building than the other ones we were looking at, but still about the same or similar per unit expense of the $127 um, per year over that full 99 year period. Um, and when we're looking at then, if we can go to the next slide, And then can we go to the next slide, please? Very good. Commissioner Hardesty, did you have another question? No, Mayor, my hand was left over. Very good. Okay. All right, well, I think I've said it all then for these particular projects, but yes, I'm happy to answer any other questions that any of you may have. Thank you. All right. Colleagues, any further questions before we move to public testimony on these items? Very good. Carla, is there any public testimony on 542, 43, 44, or 46? No one registered, Mayor. Very good. With regard to item 542, please call the roll. Hardesty. Aye. Udaley. Aye. Fritz. Thank you for all of the very clear presentations. I'll just say that once, but a minute for all of them. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. 543, also an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Hardesty. 
Uh, I think this is the one that I was really concerned about the size of the units. I, I just hope that we uh, are evaluating whether or not we are providing a truly livable space for folks who are in need of truly livable space that's affordable. I vote aye. You daily. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. 544, also an emergency ordinance. Hardesty. Aye. Udaley. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. 546 is the first reading of a non emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you, Dory. Great presentation. Carla, if you. Mayor, I, I show that as an emergency. Is my asterisk wrong there? Uh, that's weird. Mine does not. Uh, is, your, is yours the most recent one? Maybe my agenda you're, you're looking at 546 is that oh correct? you know you're right i have a i switched mine around no worries okay uh, good so if you could read 547 please authorize intergovernmental agreement with prosper portland in support of the ongoing implementation of housing functions at the portland housing bureau and economic opportunity functions at prosper portland colleagues prosper portland and the portland housing bureau share important responsibilities in providing the highest level of services to Portland residents. Prosper Portland provides economic development services, while PHB provides access to affordable housing. These agencies provide funding oversight to each other to ensure the most effective programs possible. And I believe we have, yes, there she is. There is our director, Shannon Callahan, ready to take it away. Good afternoon, Shannon. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah, good, 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 good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, this is our annual IGA with Prosper Portland that we enter into each year, which states the detailed scope of work for our shared responsibilities for um, funding levels in next year's budget. Um, due to the uh, length of time and the schedule you still have to go through, I want to just be here to answer any questions you might have. Very good. Colleagues, any questions? Any public testimony, Carla? No one registered. Call the roll. Hardesty. Oh, 547. Aye. I'm sorry. You Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Thank you, Director Callahan. I understand Anna Shook and Mike Johnson also. Uh, worked on this, so I want to acknowledge their hard work. Thank you all for this important continuation of this IGA. And with that, I vote aye, and the ordinance is adopted. 548, please. Approved findings to authorize an exemption to the competitive bidding requirements and authorize a competitive solicitation for the use of the alternative contracting method of negotiated request for proposals for construction of the Outer Division Multimodal Safety Project. Commissioner Udaley. Thank you, Mayor. The purpose of this ordinance is to authorize PBOT and procurement services to use an alternative contracting <clears throat> method for the Outer Division Multimodal Safety Project. The community requested that PBOT pursue this alternative approach out of concern for the safety of people traveling along the corridor and impacts to local businesses given all of the projects that will be under construction at the same time over the next two years. Here to present for PBOT is Elizabeth Telstrom. I, ha, there you are. Hello. <laughs> Thank, Welcome. Hi. Thanks, Commissioner Udaley. And um, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, for the record, my name is Elizabeth Tilstrom. I serve as a capital project manager for PBOT. And I'm joined today by Carrie Waters, um, PBOT's contract equ equity coordinator and Lester Spittler, um, the city's chief procurement officer. And I have a presentation that I am going to share. And bear with me. Okay. And please let me know if you can see this. Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, 
Um, we're here today, as Commissioner Udaley mentioned, we're here today to request authorization to pursue an alternative contracting method for the Outer Division Multimodal Safety Project. Um, for this presentation, I'm just going to briefly provide some background information on this project and some other projects occurring along the corridor, and then hand it off to Lester and Carrie to provide more information on why we're recommending this alternative process, as well as information on our contracting equity strategy that we'll be pursuing um, as part of this alternative process. So our project area for the safety project is on Southeast Division between 80th and 174th. So takes us as far east to the city limit. Um, as you may be aware, Southeast Division Street is a high crash corridor. Um, over the last decade, we've had 19 fatalities and 129 serious injuries. Um, we've been working on improvements to this corridor since 2011. Um, however, in 2017, Following a year with five traffic fatalities in Southeast Division, the community asked the city to take action and do more to address the serious safety issues along this corridor. So as a result, City Council directed PBOT to develop a safety action plan for division and authorized funding for a more comprehensive capital project on the corridor. Um, so when we started this project in 2017, Division Street, Division Street, excuse me, ranked number one on our high crash corridor for all modes. Um, so that includes people walking, biking, and driving. Um, and so when we studied the corridor to better understand the safety issues, here's what we found. So the street is very wide. It measures 76 feet curb to curb. And just for reference, an intersection of divisions, say between Southeast 11th and Cesar Chavez, is it's 36 feet curb to curb. So this is more than double the width um, when you get east of 82nd. Um, so for outer division, we have a very wide street. Um, we have two travel lanes in each direction, as well as a center turn lane where vehicles can enter in from either direction. Um, we have really long distances between signals, which results in drivers speeding along this stretch. Um, and then the lack of frequent signals um, leaves many of those legal um, pedestrian crossings at interse intersections unprotected. Um, we also have existing five foot bike lanes next to that outer travel lane where we have vehicles speeding sometimes on average of 45 miles per hour. Um, and then finally the street is very dark. So we have a lack of street lighting. If there is street lighting, um, it's unbalanced, it's on one side wherever we have utility poles that we've been able to attach lights to. So all of these existing conditions, um, and really lack of infrastructure, have led to a lot of the safety issues that um, we've seen on the corridor over decades. Um, so this slide kind of represents our, our plan and approach for how we're gonna address those safety issues on division. Some of these things PBOT has been able to implement over the last two years. So recently we infilled all of the missing sidewalks. So we now have a continuous sidewalk corridor um, along this segment of outer division. We moved forward with emergency projects to implement um, or to install speed safety cameras, speed reader boards. Um, we added new street lights at key areas along the intersection where we have transit stops or where we have had um, pedestrian fatalities. And then we also lowered, permanently lowered the speed limit to 30 miles per hour. Um, so all of that work was recently completed. Now with this upcoming um, outer division multimodal safety project, we'll apply the rest of this plan. So we'll build those raised center medians to address a lot of the turning movement crashes we're seeing along the corridor. We'll be installing 10 new signalized pedestrian crossings um, to create safer and more frequent opportunities for pedestrians crossing the street. In conjunction with those medians, they'll also shorten the crossing distance for pedestrians. So, you know, they have a safe refuge in the middle. They don't make it all the way across. Um, we'll be adding even more street lights through this project and then installing um, protected bike lanes. Um, and so here's just kind of a quick um, image of the existing conditions on Southeast Division Street, and then a rendering of what that future cross section is gonna look like um, under the safety project. Um, and briefly just wanted to touch upon our public involvement um, efforts through this project. So 
even though the community asked for this project um, in response to all the fatalities occurring, um, we still um, wanted to do, and we wanted to have a really robust outreach process. Um, so this kind of summarizes it. We partnered with Apano and Division Midway um, for the entirety of our outreach. Um, and th through their efforts, we were able to provide our outreach materials in eight, eight different languages, and then also hold events um, and have um, uh, translators at those events, as well as specific in-language um, business meetings and focus meetings with, with the community. Um, and then this slide kind of, you know, our outreach efforts kind of lead into this slide. So in addition to all of um, the community events, um, we've held monthly partner co coordination meetings with Apano and DMA and all the other agencies working along the corridor. So that includes TriMet and ODOT and Prosper Portland and Housing Bureau, um, just to coordinate all the work along this corridor. And so the list in front of you um, just reflects the work that's planned in the public right of way. Um, and so there's, there's more, you know, there's housing projects going on, but this is just what we're doing in the roadway. And so it was through those partner coordination meetings, and this is kind of why we're here today, where um, our partners and um, business owners and local property owners realized that there's going to be a lot of work occurring along this corridor at the same time. And the, the snapshot of the map you see at the bottom of this slide um, is a sample. This was an internal working map that PBOT staff um, had and we were working on just to make sure all of the projects are coordinated and talk to each other and the designs work together because we are all working in the same area at the same time. And so the community came to PBOT and um, asked us to, to do more um, out of concern for public safety with all these contractors working out there, as well as um, just the fact that it's gonna be such an active construction zone and impacts to um, the local business community. And so um, we worked with procurement to identify um, an alternative method that will give PBOT a little bit more control and actually reduce um, risk cost and delay risk for us, as well as um, require them to do more um, in terms of outreach uh, and coordination with the businesses, as well as coordination amongst all the contractors that are gonna be working out there. And so Lester will talk a bit more about um, the benefits of that approach. Um, briefly, here's our funding. It was um, started as an emergency project, so we kind of have a piecemealed um, funding approach for this, but in total, we have a little over 9 million to deliver this um, safety project. And then um, here's our schedule moving forward. So if we receive authorization today, our plan is to advertise the RFP next month and run that um, evaluation process through October. Um, at the same time, we are completing the design for this project. Um, so we'll have those final plans in September. And then um, once the contract's in place, um, which we're expecting um, sometime early 2021, the contractor would mobilize and begin construction. And then our goal is to um, complete all of the work by spring, summer of 2022. Um, as you're probably aware, TriMet's Division Transit Project is already under construction along the corridor. And their plan is to begin testing summer of 2022. Um, for that new transit line. And so we would like to construct our improvements and be out of the way, have all of those new signals in place um, so that TriMet can begin testing their, their line. So that is our schedule. And with that, I will turn it over to Lester um, to talk more about this alternative approach. Very good, thank you. Thanks, Liz. For the record, Lester Spittler, the city's chief procurement officer. So we, the project team and procurement staff examined four delivery options. One is the traditional low bid. The other is a, a design build. The other is the general contractor. And lastly, the negotiated RFP, which we're asking for authorization to do today. Um, we're asking for the negotiated RFP because it provides many benefits that a low bid approach would not. Um, is there an advancement on this? There we go. So with a, with a request for proposal, the city can evaluate proposals from contractors and we can evaluate their project approach, who their team members are, and their schedule that they're proposing for the, for the, for the actual construction of the work. We can also evaluate their workforce diversity commitments along with a subcontracting plan. 
Next slide. So when when we come to city council and ask for authorization to exempt a project from the low bid, we have to address findings that are both in statute and city code. There's 14 findings and we're required to address those and publish those two weeks in advance of a council hearing, such as the one that we're having right now. So Liz and the procurement, Liz and the project team and procurement staff have done that. We published those. Uh, we have not had any questions or um, anybody reach out to us. The following are some of the highlighted findings that support the use of a negotiated RFP on the project. Uh, first and foremost, we do not believe that issuing a RFP will result in any less competition than a low bid. In fact, we, we, we think that it might result in more competition. Um, we believe that a RFP will facilitate cost savings due to reducing risk of delay claims, and that's because we get to evaluate a contractor's approach in their proposal. With a low bid approach, we basically just have to accept the, the lowest responsive price without seeing their approach, their team, or their schedule. Uh, and lastly, there's various public benefits that will result as a, uh, by using a negotiated RFP. We'll be able to see, again, their approach, how they're gonna collaborate with other agencies, how they're gonna collaborate with those other contractors, utilities. We'll be able to see their approach on outreaching and engaging with local businesses and residents to make sure that they're sequencing the work to minimize disruption. We'll be able to see their approach for increased neighborhood communication, public safety. And lastly, we'll be able to see how they're gonna propose to maximize opportunities for certified firms and maximize workforce diversity on the project. So by doing an RFP, we have the ability to evaluate all of those. And uh, I'll hand it off to Carrie Waters to present the last slide. I'm certainly available for questions. Great, thank you so much, Lester and Liz. Hello, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Carrie Waters and I serve as PBOT's Contract Equity Coordinator. So I help to engage our diverse business community and to align internal processes to make sure that PBOT is a great agency to work with. I would first like to share how encouraged I've been by your recent conversations in these council sessions about the need to push ourselves as a city away from a compliance centered approach towards one that leads us to bold visionary contract equity solutions that leverage city project dollars for economic justice. I look forward to the procurement services work session later this year to discuss the larger policy issues that will unlock opportunities currently constrained within our current system. But in the meantime, I have been an enthusiastic proponent of alternative contracting methods to the low bid model, like the construction RFP being proposed before you today that allows us to consider criteria apart from cost alone, like corporate responsibility, as well as other qualifications. I'm excited to share that we have already been getting the word out about the Outer Division Multimodal Safety Project. We've circulated our summer and fall construction forecast last month, which I've shared with our community-based organizations focused on contract equity, including the National Association of Minority Contractors, the Oregon Association of Minority Entrepreneurs, and the Professional Business Development Group. I've had the opportunity to present to NAMAC in last week's virtual membership meeting, and there was a great deal of interest in this, on this project in particular as a construction RFP. I shared that this would be coming forward as a council agenda item this week, so perhaps some of them are listening in right now as we speak. Uh, many thanks to Liz for reaching out both in terms of helping to get the word out about the project in our diverse contracting community, but also to support with shaping the solicitation itself. I look forward to supporting with this process over the next month, both to ensure that the criteria and scoring help to deepen our equity commitments in action, as well as to learn more about the specifics of the solicitation so I can help to ensure that subcontracting opportunities are shared to those that need to hear about them as we learn more about the breakdown of the bid items. In addition to sharing about the subcontracting opportunities within those networks I mentioned already, I look forward to distributing this information even more widely with those who may not be affiliated with the organizations I mentioned. We will review and share information with those who have done work with PBOT already, who are documented in the city's contract compliance reporting system. And we have also initiated development of an internal engagement tracking database, which our community service aid, Zelia Guzman Torres, helped us to build out last year, and which we are working to expand via Tableau with a live link to the COVID database. So in addition to subcontractor engagement, we look forward to engaging with prime contractors themselves to learn more about their approach to outreach and engagement and to avail ourselves in helping to increase more meaningful engagement with 
that leads to the contract equity outcomes that we all aspire to. So that's all from me for now. Unless we have any immediate questions, I'll turn it back over to Liz to wrap us up. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. the presentation. Thank you. Great. And thank you, Lester and Carrie. Um, so with that, our recommendation is to accept the findings before you, which is Exhibit A to the ordinance, um, authorize the project's exemption from competitive bidding, and then authorize a competitive sol solicitation for the negotiated RFP contracting. So with that, we'll take questions. I know I sped through <laughs> my portion just to try to um, get all of this completed. So yeah. Very good. Is there any further question before we move to public? testimony on this item. That was a very thorough presentation, much appreciated. Carla, is there any public testimony on this item? No one registered, ma'am. All right, very good. This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Hardesty. Um, I greatly appreciate the presentation oh. um, and uh, I think it was very well laid out. Uh, the case was made. I certainly look forward to seeing what comes in through this negotiated RFP process and how this um, informs us as we move forward and uh, and revitalizing how we contract at the city of Portland. I'm pleased to vote aye. You daily. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for the presentation. This is just a smart way to do business on a very uh, complicated and lengthy project and I'm happy to vote aye. Fritz. Well, thank you, Elizabeth and, and uh, Carrie for the presentation. I am very glad to see these improvements being done in an area of the city that has long been neglected. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Last but not least, 549 and then we have one uh, pulled item as well. 549 next, please. Authorized an intergovernmental agreement with TriMet for Friends of Frog Ferry funding in mm -hmm. the amount of $40,000 as part of local match for the State Transportation Improvement Fund's discretionary grant in the amount of, in the amount of $200,000 to develop the Frog Ferry Operations and Finance Plan. Commissioner Daly. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this IGA reflects a commitment made between TriMet, Friends of Frog Ferry, which is a Portland-based nonprofit, and the City of Portland to explore a potential new transit service in the region using the Willamette River as an uncongested corridor. Here to present for PBOT is Mauricio Leclerc. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay. I'm a supervising planner at PBOT. I'm here to... Um, um provide you some more information i don't have a presentation because uh we're just getting started with the work so basically uh, the work that we are um, asking to embark on this iga is to do operations uh, studies uh, and finance plan for a potential transit service that would serve the region you know and, and very much portland so uh um this, has, this is in the Central City 2035 plan. You know, it's, it's a, one of the uh, recommended studies, transportation studies, uh, river transit feasibility study, uh, to uh, basically to explore funding mechanisms, phasing, and the implementation of river transit. So um, uh, Friends of Frog Ferry was formed a few years ago to advance this work. And uh, we've been doing some um, preliminary work, reconnaissance, if you will. And so far, we've done a better modeling and indicates that this is a promising uh, idea. However, we need more uh, technical analysis to really understand it. You know, we have no ferry in the no transit service in, this, in the region now, so we need technical analysis to advance the work. We think that it has a potentially great benefit in terms of providing a, a new resilient um, mode, of, mode of an additional resilient tra transit mode in the city of Portland, also provide a, a sustainable a clean energy uh, mode but also an equitable uh, move in the sense that we can probably serve uh, the St. John's Cathedral Park area, which you know seems very far away and people tell us always that it takes so long to, to get there by transit. So this is an exploration. Um, we're partnering with, par partnering with TriMet and Friends of Fork Ferry to advance the work. Um, so uh, we're happy to come back uh, once we have the results, about a year, but at this point it's just to initiate the work and uh, to provide the local 
match required to get this $200,000. So TriMet applied and they was awarded $200,000 and we provide local match for $40,000 and then for Friends of Frog Ferry provide the, the last $10,000. So um, that's basically the, um, as quickly as we could go on the, what the item is about. You know? <clears throat> and I can happy, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions um, you may have. Thank you, Mauricio. Commissioner Hardesty has a question. Can't hear you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mauricio. Uh, mm -hmm. Mauricio, um, my understanding is this Frog Ferry is it will be a for-profit organization. Is that correct? Uh, well, it's a non-profit organization. It's, and uh, you're talking about what would this be? You know, if we proceed with transit service. We my understanding is that the org the organization will be running a for-profit ferry. Is that correct? Uh, it's not my understanding. I think it's a nonprofit organization. So I think uh, there may uh, the, pre the, the president of Frog Ferry may be may be lined up for testimony. She may help you with that question. We had a detailed conversation about what two years ago during the budget conversation when they were trying to get two hundred thousand dollars out of the city of Portland. Uh, now they're trying to get forty thousand out of. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, PBOT, and my question is, what are we getting for this investment? Why why are we make, why are we putting any money into this at all? And from uh, the city perspective, and from Trimas perspective, we want to advance transit in, uh, in a well, great region. Perspective, but again, I, if it's uh, uh, okay, go ahead. Please finish. Yeah. Part. So we think again. This is there, this has been in, in our plans for many years. It's an un uncongested corridor that serves you know, populations along Portland that could benefit from another expanded transit service. And we just want to explore that option. There's a lot of technical issues, the stop, the location, you know, the docking, the vessel. So we need, we need more information to really get to the bottom and provide a, a more thorough uh, financial and operations plan. And that's what we're embarking on. And again, what is the role that PBOT is being asked to play in this process? It's uh, we will manage the contract. You know, Trimet is the recipient, but we'll manage the IGA. I will be managing, and Tom Mills will be managing. The funds are going to Frog Ferry to develop a funding plan, so that the city and Trimet understands how much. You know, what are we talking about in terms of cost and benefits of running a potential as a service? At this point, we're not we're not awarding a contract to anybody. We're just trying to understand the benefits of the potential transit service. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if I could just clarify, um, I mean, we declined to fulfill that funding request a couple of years ago, but this was what we offered as an alternative, that if Frog Ferry went out and found significant amount of um, funding, that we would contribute uh, these matching funds. And that's it. <laughs> Very good. All right. Uh, any further questions? If not, um, we'll entertain public testimony on this item. No one signed up, Mayor. All right. Please call. Oh, no. This is a non-emergency ordinance, so we don't even get that. So uh, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you all for the presentation. Um, and then we had one item pulled from the consent agenda. Thank you. 525, is that correct? 525, yes. All right, can you read 525? Authorize a one-year agreement with the Regional Arts and Culture Council to administer art programs for the city and provide for payments. Very good. First, I want to acknowledge that the COVID-19 public health emergency has obviously placed disproportionate strain on Portland's arts ecosystem. Many of our cultural institutions, venues, and artists have been first impacted by the stay home, save lives mandate. And it seems likely that the Portland arts community will be amongst the last to resume so-called normal activities. My colleagues and I recognize the anguish that Portland artists feel in the midst of such an uncertain future. We all cannot imagine a Portland without a strong, vibrant, and creative community. It's integral to who we are as a community. It's in our DNA. Yet, at the same time, the demands of this city are 
unprecedented, and we're all moving ahead into an unknown future together. At the beginning of this year, the City Arts Program and the Regional Arts and Culture Council were in the very beginning stages of developing a new long-term cultural arts program for Portland, which would chart our strategy and our vision for the years ahead. Fast forward a few months into the pandemic, and we're moving towards uh, an unknown future across all of our sectors. In light of these uncertainties, the city and RAC made the decision to enter into a one-year agreement with the Regional Arts and Culture Council to add flexibility to our partnership and provide additional time to assess the needs of the arts community. RAC has already taken steps to respond to COVID-19, but over the next 12 months, it's my hope that within conjunction with the Commissioner of Arts and Culture and the City Arts Program, we will begin developing a plan for a more resilient arts ecosystem that serves all of Portland. With that, here to present is GN Kim. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, and good morning, Council. I guess it's lunchtime now. Um, I'm GN Kim, the City Arts Program Manager with the Office of Management and Finance. Um, just the purpose, you know, this uh, B who had pulled this item, she thought it was the CARES Act. Um, and so I redirected her to next week's um, session and well, she'll provide testimony. Um, but this is just a one-year contract. As you mentioned, Mayor, this agreement is largely the same as the prior agreements with RAC. Um, it moves forward uh, a few changes. It provides more clarity and transparency about how special appropriations are being allocated within RAC's administration and programs. It includes uh, language about how the city and RAC will work through the requirements of federally funded projects. And it provides kind of a 12 month runway for the city arts program, uh, RAC and our uh, uh, partnership with the Commissioner of Arts and Culture uh, to kind of analyze long-term effects of the coronavirus and determine what the best use of the resources of the city are to um, help uh, kind of mitigate that impact. And then, um, you know, once we understand what our new normal is, we plan to develop a multi-year uh, contract with RAC with some new goals that uh, address the concerns that we know are happening right now with uh, the coronavirus. Um, and, you know, I, I'll just say that, you know, the City Arts Program, we really look forward to partnering with RAC over the next 12 months, um, along with the uh, uh, Commissioner E. Daly's office to, you know, figure out what our next steps are to address all, all the things that are happening within the arts ecosystem. So that's it. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any further comments, questions? Carla, is there any public testimony? Uh, no, B. Marchison had her questions answered. All right, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we'll call the roll. This is an emergency ordinance. Hardesty? Aye. You daily. You're on mute, Commissioner. I want to take a moment to appreciate all the vital work that RAC has undertaken amidst this crisis without any additional support from the city, uh, and in fact, a budget cut for the 2021 fiscal year. They developed and administered a statewide survey to see how the pandemic was affecting our communities. They provided seed funding and conducted fundraising uh, for the emergency fund for artists and creative workers, raising over 200000 dollars and funding nearly half of the eligible applications submitted. And they've worked with local arts funders to create and fund the Oregon Arts and Cultural Recovery Program with $1.5 million in investments and preference given to applicants that are led by and primarily serve disproportionately impacted communities including Black, Indigenous, communities of color, low income, rural geographically isolated LGBTQ and individuals uh, with disabilities, refugees, immigrants, and other vulnerable or historically underserved populations, um, or organizations that serve as a hub or facilitator for small organizations, unincorporated groups, and individual artists. This contract will provide more transparency to RAC's operations and provides more special appropriations funding to artists and arts organization uh, uh, organizations at a time when they're really hurting. So thank you, Rack. Thank you, GN. Uh, and thank you, OMF and Mayor. I vote aye. 
topics. Commissioner Fritz. Oh, sorry, I, I, I was not muted and then I muted myself, I. Wheeler. Happy to support this. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Daly. I vote aye. Oh, I forgot the most important part. <laughs> the ordinance is adopted. Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you back here at 2 p.m. We are adjourned.